Chapter Sixteen of the Green Rust by Edgar Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Kirsten Weber. The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace. Chapter Sixteen, The Pawn Ticket. Oliver Cresswell awoke to consciousness as she was being carried up the stairs of the house. She may have recovered sooner, for she retained a confused impression of being laid down amidst waving grasses, and of hearing somebody grunt that she was heavier than he thought. Also, she remembered as dimly the presence of Dr. Van Herden standing over her, and he was wearing a long grey dust coat. As her captor kicked open the door of her room, she scrambled out of his arms and leant against the bed rail for support. "'I'm all right,' she said breathlessly. "'It was foolish to faint, but—but but you frightened me.' The man grinned, and seemed about to speak, but a sharp voice from the landing called him, and he went out, slamming the door behind him. She crossed to the bathroom, bathed her face in cold water, and felt better, though she was still a little giddy. Then she sat down to review the situation, and in that review two figures came alternately into prominence, Van Herden and Beale. She was an eminently sane girl. She had the beginnings of what might have been an unusually fine education, had it not been interrupted by the death of her foster-mother. She had, too, the advantage which the finished young lady does not possess— of having grafted to the wisdom of the schools the sure understanding of men and things which personal contact with struggling humanity can alone give us. The great problems of life had been sprung upon her with all their hideous realism, and through all she had retained her poise and her clear vision. Many of the phenomena represented by man's attitude to woman she could understand, but that a man who admittedly did not love her, and had no other apparent desire than to rid himself of the incubus of a wife as soon as he was wed, should wish to marry her, was incomprehensible. That he had already published the bans of her marriage left her gasping at his audacity. Strange how her thoughts leapt all the events of the morning, the wild rush to escape, the struggle with a hideously masked man, and all that went before or followed, and went back to the night before. Somehow she knew that Van Herden had told her the truth, and that there was behind this act of his a deeper significance than she could grasp. She remembered what he had said about Beale, and flushed. "'You're silly, Matilda,' she said to herself, employing the term of address which she reserved for moments of self-deprecation. Here is a young man you have only met half a dozen times, who is probably a very nice married policeman with a growing family, and you are going hot and cold at the suggestion that you're in love with him. She shook her head reproachfully. And yet upon Beale all her thoughts were centred and however they might wander, it was to Beale they returned. She could analyze that buoyancy which had asserted itself, that confidence which had suddenly become a mental armor, which repelled every terrifying thought, to this faith she had in a man who a few weeks before she had looked upon as an incorrigible drunkard. She had time for thought, and really, though this she did not acknowledge, she desperately needed the occupation of that thought. What was Beale's business? Why did he employ her to copy out this list of American and Canadian statistics? Why did he want to know all these hotels, their proprietors, the chief of police, and the like? She wished she had her papers and books, so that she might go on extracting that interminable list. What would Van Herden do now? Would her attempted escape change his plans? How would he overcome the difficulty of marrying a girl who was certain to denounce him in the presence of so independent a witness as a clergyman? She would die before she married him, she told herself. She could not rest, and walked about the room, examining the framed prints and looking at the books, 
and occasionally walking to the glass above the dressing-chest to see if any sign was left of the red mark on her cheek where Van Herden's hand had fallen. This exercise gave her a curious satisfaction, and when she saw that the mark had subsided and was blending more to the color of her skin, she felt disappointed. Startled, she analyzed this curious mental attitude, and again came to Beale. She wanted Beale to see the place. She wanted Beale's sympathy. She wanted Beale's rage. She was sure he would rage. She laughed to herself, and for want of other and better amusement, walked to the drawers in the dressing bureau and examined their contents. They were empty and unlocked, save one which refused to respond to her tug. She remembered she had a small bunch of keys in her bag. "'I am going to be impertinent. Forgive the liberty,' she said, as she felt the lock give to the first attempt. She pulled the drawer open. It contained a few articles of feminine attire and a thick black leather portfolio. She lifted this out, laid it on the table, and opened it. It was filled with fool's cap. Written on the cover was the word Argentine, and somehow the writing was familiar to her. It was a bold hand, obviously feminine. "'Where have I seen that before?' she asked, and knitted her forehead. She turned the first leaf and read. El Cigar Hotel, Furnos, Proprietor Miguel Porcerini, Index 2. Her mouth opened in astonishment, and she ran down the list. She took out another folder. It was marked Canada, and she turned the leaves rapidly. She recognized this work. It was the same work that Beale had given to her, a list of the hotels, their proprietors, and means of conveyance but there was no reference to the police, and then it dawned upon her an unusually long description produced certain characteristics of writing which she recognized. Hilda Glaum, she said, I wonder what this means. She examined the contents of the drawer again, and some of them puzzled her. Not the little stack of handkerchiefs, the folded collars, and the like, if Hilda Glaum was in the habit of visiting Dean's Folly and used this room, it was natural that these things should be here. If this were her bureau, the little carton of nibs and the spare notebook were to be expected. It was the steel box which set her wondering. This she discovered in the far corner of the drawer. If she could have imagined anything so fantastic, she might have believed that the box had been specially made to hold the thing it contained, and preserve it from the dangers of fire. The lid, which closed with a spring catch, released by the pressure of a tiny button, was perfectly fitted, so that the box was, in all probability, air-tight. She opened it without difficulty. The sides were lined with what seemed to be, at first sight, thick cardboard, but which proved on closer inspection to be asbestos. She opened it with a sense of eager anticipation, but her face fell. Save for a tiny square blue envelope at the bottom, the box was empty. She lifted it in her hand to shake out the envelope, and it was then that the idea occurred to her that the box had been made for the envelope, which refused to budge until she lifted one end with a hairpin. It was unsealed, and she slipped in her finger and pulled out a pawn ticket. She had an inclination to laugh, which she checked. She examined the ticket curiously. It announced the fact that Messrs. Rosenblum Brothers of Commercial Road, London, had advanced ten shillings on a gent's silver hunter watch, and the pledge had been made in the name of Van Herden. She gazed at it, bewildered. He was not a man who needed ten shillings, or ten dollars, or ten pounds. Why should he pledge a watch, and why, having pledged it, should he keep the ticket with such care? Oliver hesitated a moment, then slipped the ticket from its cover, put back the envelope at the bottom of the box, and closed the lid. 
she found a hiding-place for the little square pasteboard before she returned the box and portfolio to the drawer and locked it. There was a tap at the door, and hastily she replaced the key in her bag. "'Come in,' she said. She recognized the man who stood in the doorway as he who had carried her back to the room. There was a strangeness in his bearing which made her uneasy, a certain subdued hilarity which suggested drunkenness. "'Don't make a noise,' he whispered, with a stifled chuckle. "'If Gregory hears, he'll raise fire.' She saw that the key was in the lock on the outside of the door, and this she watched. But he made no attempt to withdraw it, and closed the door behind him softly. "'My name is Bridgers,' he whispered. "'Van Herden has told you about me. Horace Bridgers, do you?' He took out a little tortoise-shell box from the pocket of his frayed waistcoat, and opened it with a little kick of his middle finger. It was half full of white powder that glittered in a stray ray of sunlight. "'Try a sniff,' he begged eagerly, "'and all your troubles will go foot.' "'Thank you, no,' she shook her head, looking at him with a perplexed smile. "'I don't know what it is.' "'It's the white terror. he chuckled again. "'Better than the green, not so horribly musty as the green, eh?' "'I'm not in the mood for terrors of any kind,' she said, with a half-smile. She wondered why he had come, and had a momentary hope that he was ignorant of Van Herden's character. "'All right.' He stuffed the box back into his waistcoat pocket. "'You're the loser. You'll never find heaven on earth.' She waited. All the time he was speaking, it seemed to her that he was on the qui vive for some interruption from below. He would stop in his speech to turn a listening ear to the door. Moreover, she was relieved to see he made no attempt to advance any farther into the room. That he was under the influence of some drug, she guessed. His eyes glittered with unnatural brilliance. His hands, discolored and uncleanly, moved nervously, and were never still. "'I'm Bridgers,' he said again. "'I'm Van Herden's best man, rather a come-down for the best analytical chemist that the school ever turned out, eh? Doing odd jobs for a dirty Deutscher.' He walked the door, opened it, and listened, then tiptoed across the room to her. "'You know,' he whispered, "'you're Van Herden's girl. What is the game?' "'What is?' she stammered. "'What is the game? What is it all about? "'I've tried to pump Gregory and Milsom, but they're mysterious. "'Curse all mysteries, my dear. What is the game? "'Why are they sending men to America, Canada, Australia, and India? "'Come along and be a pal. Tell me. "'I've seen the office. I know all about it.' thousands of sealed envelopes filled with steamship tickets and money, thousands of telegraph forms already addressed. You don't fool me. He hissed the last words almost in her face. Why is he employing the crocks and the throwouts of science? Perilli, Maxon, Boyd Hyler, Ben Me. If the game's square, why doesn't he take the new men from the schools? She shook her head, being by now less interested in such revelations as he might make, than in her own personal comfort, for his attitude was growing menacing. Then the great idea came to her. Evidently this man knew nothing of the circumstances under which she had come to the house. To him she was a willful but willing assistant to the doctor who, for some reason or other, it had been necessary to place under restraint. "'I will tell you everything, if you will take me back to my home,' she said. "'I cannot give you proofs here.' She saw suspicion gather in his eyes. Then he laughed. "'That won't wash,' he sneered. "'You know it all. I can't leave here,' he said." "'Besides, you told me last time that there was nothing. "'I used to watch you working away at night,' he went on, to the girl's amazement. "'I've sat looking at you for hours, writing and writing and writing.' She understood now. 
she and hilda glaum were of about the same build and she was mistaken for hilda by this bemused man who had in all probability never seen the other girl face to face what made you run away he asked suddenly but with a sudden resolve she brought him back to the subject he had started to discuss what is the use of my telling you she asked you know as much as i only bits he replied eagerly but i don't know van herden's game i know why he's marrying this other girl everybody knows that when is the wedding what other girl she asked cresswell or prado whatever she calls herself said bridgers carelessly she was a store girl wasn't she but she tried to speak calmly why do you think he wants to marry her he laughed softly don't be silly he said you can't fool me everybody knows she's worth a million worth a million she gasped worth a million he smacked his lips and fumbled for the little box in his waistcoat pocket try a sniff you'll know what it feels like to be old man millenborn's heiress there was a sound in the hall below and he turned with an exaggerated start she thought it theatrical but could not know of the jangled nerves of the drug-sodden man which magnified all sound to an intensity which was almost painful he opened the door and slid out and did not close the door behind him swiftly she followed and as she reached the landing saw his head disappear down the stairs she was in a blind panic a thousand formless terrors gripped her and turned her resolute soul to water she could have screamed her relief when she saw that the sliding door was half open the man had not stopped to close it and she passed through and down the first flight he had vanished before she reached the halfway landing and the hall below was empty it was a wide hall stone flagged with a glass door between her and the open portal she flew down the stairs pulled open the door and ran straight into van herden's arms End of chapter 16 Recorded by Kirsten Weber Chapter 17 of The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Kirsten Weber The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace Chapter 17 The Chew of Krakow if there were committed in london the crime of the century a crime so tremendous that the names of the chief actors in this grisly drama were on the lips of every man woman and talkative child in europe you might walk into a certain department of scotland yard with the assurance that you would not meet within the confining walls of that bureau any police officer who was interested in the slightest or who indeed had even heard of the occurrence save by accident this department is known as the parley vous or p v department and concerns itself only in suspicious events beyond the territorial waters of great britain and ireland its body is on the thames embankment but its soul is at the central office or at the sûreté or even at the yamen of the police minister of pekin it is sublimely ignorant of the masters of crime who dwell beneath the shadows of the yard but it could tell you without stopping to look up reference not only the names of the known gunmen of new york but the composition of almost every secret society in china a pole had a quarrel with a jew in the streets of krakow and they quarrelled over the only matter which is worthy of quarrel in that part of poland the sum in dispute was the comparatively paltry one of two hundred and sixty kronen but when the jew was taken in a dying condition to the hospital he made a statement which was so curious that the chief of police in krakow sent it on to vienna and vienna sent it to bern and bern scratched its chin thoughtfully and sent it forward to paris 
where it was distributed to Rio de Janeiro, New York, and London. The assistant chief of the P.V. department came out of his room and drifted aimlessly into the uncomfortable bureau of Mr. McNaughton. "'There's a curious yarn through from Krakow,' he said, "'which might interest your friend Beale.' "'What is it?' asked McNaughton, who invariably found the stories of the P.V. department fascinating but profitless. "'A man was murdered,' said the P.V. man lightly, as though that were the least important feature of the story. But before he pegged out, he made a will or an assignment of his property to his son, in the course of which he said that none of his stocks—he was a corn factor— were to be sold under one thousand cronen a bushel. That's about thirty pounds. Corn at thirty pounds a bushel, said McNorton. Was he delirious? Not at all, said the other. He was a very well-known man in Krakow, one Zibowski, who during the late war was principal buying agent for the German government. The chief of police at Krakow apparently asked him if he wasn't suffering from illusions, and the man then made a statement that the German government had an option on all the grain in Galatia, Hungary, and the Ukraine at a lower price. Zabowski held out for better terms. It is believed that he was working with a member of the German government who made a fortune in the war out of army contracts. In fact, he as good as let this out just before he died, when he spoke in his delirium of a wonderful invention which was being worked on behalf of the German government, an invention called the Green Rust. McNorton whistled. "'Is that all?' he said. "'That's all,' said the P.V. man. I seem to remember that Beale had made one or two mysterious references to the Rust. Where is he now?' "'He left town last night,' replied McNorton. "'Can you get in touch with him?' The other shook his head. "'I suppose you are sending on a copy of this communication to the Cabinet,' he said. "'It may be rather serious. Whatever the scheme is, it is being worked in London, and Van Herden is the chief operator.' He took down his hat and went out in search of Kitson, whom he found in the lobby of the hotel. James Kitson came toward him eagerly. "'Have you news of Beale?' "'He was at Kingston this morning,' said McNorton, "'with Parson Homo.' but he had left. I was on the phone to the inspector at Kingston, who did not know very much, and could give me no very definite news as to whether Beale had made his discovery. He interviewed the tramp early this morning, but apparently extracted very little that was helpful. As a matter of fact, I came to you to ask if he had got in touch with you. Kitson shook his head. I want to see him about his green rust scare. "'Beale has gone single-handed into this matter,' said the superintendent, shaking his head, "'and he has played the lone game a little too long. "'Is it very serious?' "'It may be an international matter,' replied McNorton gravely. "'All that we know at present is this. "'A big plot is on foot to tamper with the food supplies of the world, "'and the chief plotter is Van Herden.' Beale knows more about the matter than any of us, but he only gives us occasional glimpses of the real situation. I have been digging out Van Herden's record, without, however, finding anything very incriminating. Up to a point, he seems to have been a model citizen, though his associates were not always of the best. He has been seen in the company of at least three people with a bad history— Milsom, a doctor convicted of murder in the nineties, Bridgers, a chemist with two convictions for illicit trading in drugs, Gregory, who seems to be his factotum and general assistant, convicted in Manchester for saccharin smuggling, and a girl called Glaum, who is an alien, charged during the war for failing to register. But against Van Herden? Nothing. He has travelled a great deal in America and on the continent. He was in Spain a few years ago, and was suspected of being associated with the German embassy. His association with the Milbourne murder, you know. Yes, I know that, said James Kitson bitterly. 
Beal will have to tell us all he knows, McNorton went on, and probably we can tell him something he doesn't know, namely that Van Herden conducts a pretty expensive correspondence by cable with all parts of the world. Something has happened in Krakow which gives a value to all Beale's suspicions. Briefly he related the gist of the story which had reached him that morning. "'It is incredible,' said Kitson, when the chief had finished. "'It would be humanly impossible for the world to buy at that price, and there is no reason for it. It happens that I am interested in a milling corporation, and I know that the world's crops are good. In fact, the harvest will be well above the average. I should say that the Krakow Jew was talking in delirium.' But McNorton smiled indulgently. "'I hope you're right,' he said. "'I hope the whole thing is a mare's nest, and for once in my life I trust that the police clues are as wrong as hell. But, anyway, Van Herden is cabling mighty freely, and I want Beale.' But Beale was unreachable. A visit to his apartment produced no results. The foreign gentleman, who on the previous day had called on Van Herden, had been seen there that morning, but he too had vanished, and none of McNorton's watchers had been able to pick him up. McNorton shifted the direction of his search and dropped into the palatial establishment of Ponsonby's. He strolled past the grill-hidden desk which had once held Oliver Cresswell, and saw out of the tail of his eye a stranger in her place, and by her side the darkly taciturn Hilda Glaum. Mr. White, that pompous man, greeted him strangely. As the police chief came into the private office, Mr. White half rose, turned deadly pale, and became of a sudden bereft of speech. McNorton recognized the symptoms from long acquaintance with the characteristics of detected criminals, and wondered how deeply this pompous man was committed to whatever scheme was hatching. "'Ah, uh, ah, uh, Mr. McNorton,' stammered White, shaking like a leaf. Mm, "'Won't you sit down, please? To what, uh, to what?' He swallowed twice before he could get the words out. "'To what am I indebted?' "'Just called in to look you up,' said McNorton, genially. "'Have you been losing any more registered letters lately?' Mr. White subsided again into his chair. "'Yes, yes, no, I mean,' he said. "'No, ah, uh, thank you. It was kind of you to call, Inspector.' "'Superintendent,' corrected the other, good-humouredly. "'A thousand pardons, Superintendent,' said White hastily. "'No, sir, nothing so unfortunate.' He shot a look, half fearful, half resentful, at the police officer. "'And how is your friend, Dr. Van Herden?' Mr. White twisted uncomfortably in his chair, again his look of nervousness and apprehension. "'Mr. Uh, Van Herden is not a friend of mine,' he said. "'A business acquaintance,' he sighed heavily. "'Just a business acquaintance.' The white he had known was not the white of today. The man looked older. His face was more heavily lined, and his eyes were dark with weariness. "'I suppose he's a pretty shrewd fellow,' he remarked carelessly. "'You are interested in some of his concerns, aren't you?' "'Only one, only one,' replied White sharply. "'And I wish to heaven—' he stopped himself. "'And you wish you weren't, eh?' Again the older man wriggled in his chair. "'Dr. Van Herden is very clever,' he said. "'He has uh, great schemes, in one of which I am, ah, uh, financially interested. "'That is all. I have put money into his, ah, uh, syndicate, uh, "'without, of course, knowing the nature of the work which is being carried out, "'that I would impress upon you. "'You are a trusting investor,' said the good-humoured McNorton. "'I am a child in matters of finance,' admitted Mr. White, but added quickly, "'Except, of course, in so far as the finance of Ponsonby's, 
which is one of the soundest business concerns in London, Mr. McNorton. We pay our dividends regularly, and our balance sheets are a model for the industrial world. So I have heard, said McNorton dryly. I am interested in syndicates, too. By the way, what is Dr. Van Herden's scheme? Mr. White shrugged his shoulders. I haven't the slightest idea, he confessed with a melancholy smile. I suppose it is very foolish of me, but I have such faith in the doctor's genius that when he came to me and said, My dear White, I want you to invest a few thousand in one of my concerns, I said, My dear doctor, here is my check. Don't bother me about the details, but send in my dividends regularly. Ha, ha. His laugh was hollow, and would not have deceived a child of ten. "'So you've invested forty thousand pounds,' began McNorton. Forty thousand gasped Mr. White. "'How did you know?' He went a trifle paler. "'These things get about,' said McNorton. "'As I was going to say, you invested forty thousand pounds.' without troubling to discover what sort of work the syndicate was undertaking. "'I am not speaking now as a police officer, Mr. White,' he went on, and White did not disguise his relief, but as an old acquaintance of yours. "'Say, friend,' said the fervent Mr. White, "'I have always regarded you, Mr. McNorton, as a friend of mine. Let me see, how long have we known one another?' "'I think the first time we met was when Punsonby's was burgled in ninety-three. "'It's a long time,' said McNorton. "'But don't let us get off the subject of your investment, which interests me as a friend. "'You gave Dr. Van Herden all this money without even troubling to discover whether his enterprise was a legal one. "'I am not suggesting it was illegal,' he said, as White opened his mouth to protest. "'But it seems strange that you did not trouble to inquire. "'Oh, of course, I inquired, naturally. "'I inquired, Mr. McNorton,' said White eagerly. "'It was for some chemical process, and I know nothing about chemistry. "'I don't mind admitting to you,' he lowered his voice, "'though there was no necessity, "'that I regret my investment very much.' We businessmen have many calls. We cannot allow our money to be tied up for too long a time, and it happens, ah, uh, that uh, just at this moment I should be very glad, very glad indeed, to liquidate that investment. Mr. McNorton nodded. He knew a great deal more about White's financial embarrassments than that gentleman gave him credit for. He knew, for example, that the immaculate managing director of Punsonby's was in the hands of money-lenders, and that those money-lenders were squeezing him. He suspected that all was not well with Punsonby's. There had been curious rumors in the city, amongst the bill discounters, that Punsonby's paper left much to be desired. "'Do you know the nationality of Van Herden?' he asked. Dutch replied Mr. White promptly. "'Are you sure of this?' "'I would stake my life on it,' answered the heroic Mr. White. "'As I came through your office, I saw a young lady at the cashier's desk. Miss Glaum, I think her name is. Is she Dutch, too?' "'Miss Glaum, ah, uh, well, ah, uh, Miss Glaum,' White hesitated. "'A very nice, industrious girl.' and a friend of Dr. Van Herden's. As a matter of fact, I engaged her at his recommendation. You see, I was under an obligation to the doctor. He had, uh, attended me in my illness. That this was untrue, McNorton knew. White was one of those financial shuttlecocks, which shrewd money-lenders toss from one to the other. White had been introduced by Van Herden, to capital in a moment of hectic despair, and had responded, when his financial horizon was clearer, by pledging his credit for the furtherance of Van Herden's scheme. 
Of course you know that, as a shareholder in Van Herden's syndicate, you cannot escape responsibility for the purposes to which your money is put, he said as he rose to go. I hope you get your money back. "'Do you think there is any doubt?' demanded White, in consternation. "'There is always a doubt about getting money back from syndicates,' said McNorton cryptically. "'Please don't go yet,' Mr. White passed round the end of his desk, and intercepted the detective with unexpected agility, taking, so to speak, the door out of his hands and closing it. "'I am alarmed, Mr. McNorton.' he said, as he led the other back to his chair. I won't disguise it. I am seriously alarmed by what you have said. It is not the thought of losing the money. Oh, dear, no. Punsonby's would not be ruined by, ah, uh, a paltry forty thousand pounds. It is, if I may be allowed to say so, the sinister suggestion in your speech, Inspector, Superintendent, I mean. Is it possible— he stood squarely in front of McNorton, his hands on his hips, his eyeglass dangling from his fastidious fingers, and his head pulled back as though he wished to avoid contact with the possibility. Is it possible that, in my ignorance, I have been existing to finance a scheme which is, ah, uh, illegal, immoral, improper, and contrary, ah, uh, to the best interests of the common weal? He shook his head as though he were unable to believe his own words. "'Everything is possible in finance,' said McNorton, with a smile. "'I am not saying that Dr. Van Herden's syndicate is an iniquitous one. I have not even seen a copy of his articles of association. Doubtless you could oblige me in that respect.' "'I haven't got such a thing,' denied Mr. White vigorously. The syndicate was not registered. It was, so to speak, a private concern. But the exploitation of green rust, suggested the superintendent, and the man's face lost the last vestige of color it possessed. The green rust? he faltered. I have heard the phrase. I know nothing. You know nothing but suspect the worst, said McNorton. Now I am going to speak plainly to you. The reason you know nothing about this syndicate of Van Herden's is because you had a suspicion that it was being formed for an illegal purpose. Please don't interrupt me. You know nothing because you did not want to know. I doubt even whether you deceived yourself. You saw a chance of making big money, Mr. White, and big money has always had an attraction for you. There isn't a fool's scheme that was ever hatched in a back-alley bar that you haven't dropped money over, and you saw a chance here more tangible than any that had been presented to you. I swear to you, began White, the time has not come for you to swear anything, said McNorton sternly. There is only one place where a man need take his oath, and that is on the witness stand. I will tell you this frankly, that we are as much in the dark as you pretend to be. There is only one man who knows or guesses the secret of the green rust, and that man is Beale. Beale! You have met the gentleman, I believe. I hope you don't have to meet him again. The green rust may mean little. It may mean no more than that you will lose your money, and I should imagine that is the least which will happen to you. On the other hand, Mr. White, I do not disguise from you the fact that it may also mean your death at the hands of the law. White made a gurgling noise in his throat and held on to the desk for support. I have only the haziest information as to what it is all about. But somehow, McNorton knit his brows in a frown, and was speaking half to himself, I seem to feel that it is a bad business, a damnably bad business. He took up his hat from the table, and walked to the door. I don't know whether to say au revoir or good-bye, he said with twitching lips. 
"'Good-bye, ah, uh, is a very good old-fashioned word,' said Mr. White, in an heroic attempt to imitate the other's good humour. End of chapter 17 Recorded by Kirsten Weber Chapter 18 of The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Kirsten Weber. The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace. Chapter 18. Bridgers Breaks Loose. Dr. Van Herden sat by the side of the big four-poster bed where the girl lay, and his cold blue eyes held a spark of amusement. You look very foolish, he said. Oliver Cresswell turned her head sharply, so as to remove the man from her line of vision. More than this she could not do, for her hands and feet were strapped, and on the pillow near her head was a big bath-towel saturated with water, which had been employed in stifling her healthy screams, which marked her return to understanding. "'You look very foolish,' said the doctor, chewing at the end of his cigar. "'And you look no more foolish than you have been. "'Bridgers let you out, eh? Nice man, Bridgers. "'What had he been telling you?' "'She turned her head again and favoured him with a stare. "'Then she looked at the angry red mark on her wrists where the straps chafed. "'How hun-like,' she said, but this time he smiled. "'You will not make me lose my temper again, little wife-to-be.' He mocked her. You may call me Han, or Heinz, or Fritz, or any of the barbarous and vulgar names which the outside world employ to vilify my countrymen, but nothing you say will distress or annoy me. Tomorrow you and I will be man and wife. This is not Germany, she said scornfully. You cannot make a woman marry you against her will. This is— the land of the free, he interrupted suavely. Yes, I know those lands on both sides of the Atlantic. But even there curious things happen, and you're going to marry me. You will say yes to the sleek English clergyman when he asks you whether you will take this man to be your married husband, to love and cherish, and all that sort of thing. You'll say yes. "'I shall say no,' she said steadily. "'You will say yes,' he smiled. "'I had hoped to be able to give sufficient time to you, "'so that I might persuade you to act sensibly. "'I could have employed arguments, "'which I think would have convinced you "'that there are worse things than marriage with me.' "'I cannot think of any,' she replied coldly. "'Then you are singularly dense,' said the doctor. I have already told you the conditions under which that marriage will take place. There might be no marriage, you know, and a different end to this adventure, he said significantly, and she shivered. He said nothing more for five minutes, simply sitting biting at the cigar between his teeth, and looking at her blankly, as though his thoughts were far away and she was the least of the problems which confronted him. "'I know it is absurd to ask you,' he said suddenly, "'but I presume you have not devoted any of your studies "'to the question of capital punishment. "'I see you haven't. "'But there is one interesting fact about the execution of criminals "'which is not generally known to the public, "'and it is that in many countries, my own, for example, "'before a man is led to execution he is doped with a drug which I will call bromocine. Does that interest you? She made no reply, and he laughed quietly. It should interest you very much, he said. The effect of bromocine, he went on, speaking with the quiet precision of one who was lecturing on the subject to an interested audience, is peculiar. It reduces the subject to a condition of extreme lassitude, so that really nothing matters or seems to matter. Whilst perfectly conscious, the subject goes obediently to his death. 
behaves normally and does just what he is told. In fact, it destroys the will. Why do you tell me this? she asked, a sudden fear gripping her heart. He half turned in his chair, reached out his hand, and took a little black case from the table near the window. This he laid on the bed and opened, and she watched him fascinated. He took a tiny bottle containing a colorless liquid, and with great care laid it on the coverlet. Then he extracted a small hypodermic syringe and a needle-pointed nozzle. He uncorked the bottle, inserted the syringe, and filled it. Then he screwed on the needle, pressed the plunger until a fine jet leapt in the air. Then he laid it carefully back in the case. You say you will not marry me, and I presume that you would make a scene when I bring in the good English parson to perform the ceremony. I had hoped, he said apologetically, to have given you a wedding with all the pomp and circumstance which women, as I understand, love. Failing that, I hoped for a quiet wedding in the little church out yonder. He jerked his head toward the window. But now I'm afraid that I must ask his reverence to carry out the ceremony in this house. He rose, leant over her, and deftly pulled back her sleeve. If you scream, I shall smother you with the towel, he said. This won't hurt you very much. As I was going to say, you will be married here, because you are in a delicate state of health, and you will say yes. She winced as the needle punctured the skin. It won't hurt you very long, he said calmly. You will say yes, I repeat, because I shall tell you to say yes. Suddenly the sharp, pricking pain in her arm ceased. She was conscious of a sensation as though her arm was being blown up like a bicycle tire. But it was not unpleasant. He withdrew the needle and kept his finger pressed upon the little red wound where it had gone in. "'I shall do this to you again to-night,' he said. "'And you will not feel it at all, and to-morrow morning, and you will not care very much what happens.' I hope it will not be necessary to give you a dose to-morrow afternoon. I shall not always be under the influence of this drug, she said between her teeth, and there will be a time of reckoning for you, Dr. Van Hadden. By which time, he said calmly, I shall have committed a crime so wonderful and so enormous that the mere offence of administering a noxious drug that is the terminology which describes the offence, will be of no importance and hardly worth the consideration of the crown officers. Now I think I can unfasten you. He loosened and removed the straps at her wrists and about her feet, and put them in his pocket. You had better get up and walk about, he said, or you will be stiff. I am really being very kind to you if only you knew it. I am too big to be vindictive, and, by the way, I had an interesting talk with your friend Mr. Beale this afternoon, a persistent young man who has been having me shadowed all day. He laughed quietly. If I hadn't to go back to the surgery for the Bromo scene, I should have missed our very interesting conversation. That young man is very much in love with you. He looked amusedly at the growing red in her face. "'He is very much in love with you,' he repeated. "'What a pity, what a thousand pities!' "'How soon will this drug begin to act?' she asked. "'Are you frightened?' "'No, but I should welcome anything which made me oblivious to your presence. "'You are not exactly a pleasant companion,' she said." with a return to the old tone he knew so well. "'Content yourself, little person,' he said with simulated affection. "'You will soon be rid of me. Why do you want to marry me?' "'I can tell you that now,' he said, "'because you are a very rich woman, and I want your money, half of which comes to me on my marriage.' "'Then the man spoke the truth.' She sat up suddenly, but the effort made her head swim. 
He caught her by her shoulders and laid her gently down. "'What, man, not that babbling idiot Bridges?' He said something, but instantly recovered his self-possession. "'Keep quiet,' he said with professional sternness. "'Yes, you are the heiress of an interesting gentleman named John Millenborn.' "'John Millenborn!' she gasped. "'The man who was murdered!' "'The man who was killed,' he corrected. "'Murder is a stupid, vulgar word. "'Yes, my dear, you are his heiress. "'He was your uncle, and he left you something over six million dollars. "'That is to say, he left us that colossal sum. "'But I don't understand. What does it mean?' "'Your name is Predo. Your father was the ruffian.' "'I know, I know,' she cried. "'The man in the hotel, the man who died, my father.' "'Interesting, isn't it?' he said calmly. "'Like something out of a book. Yes, my dear, that was your parent, a dissolute ruffian whom you will do well to forget.' I heard John Millenborn tell his lawyer that your mother died of a broken heart, penniless as a result of your father's cruelty and unscrupulousness, and I should imagine that that was the truth. My father, she murmured. She lay, her face as white as the pillow, her eyes closed. John Millenborn left a fortune for you and I think that you might as well know the truth now. The money was left in trust. You were not to know that you were an heiress until you were married. He was afraid of some fortune-hunter ruining your young life, as Predo ruined your mother's. That was thoughtful of him. Now, I don't intend ruining your life. I intend leaving you with half your uncle's fortune— and the capacity for enjoying all that life can hold for a high-spirited young woman i'll not do it i'll not do it i'll not do it she muttered he rose from the chair and bent over her my young friend you are going to sleep he said to himself waited a little longer and left the room closing the door behind him he descended to the hall and passed into the big dining-hall beneath the girl's bedroom. The room had two occupants, a stout, hairless man, who had neither hair, eyebrows, nor vestige of beard, and a younger man. "'Hello, Bridges,' said Van Herden, addressing the latter. "'You've been talking.' "'Well, who doesn't?' snarled the man. He pulled the tortoise-shell box from his pocket, opened the lid, and took a pinch from its contents, snuffing the powder luxuriously. "'That stuff will kill you one of these days,' said Van Herden. "'It will make him better tempered,' growled the hairless man. "'I don't mind people who take cocaine, as long as they are taking it. It's between dopes that they get on my nerves.' "'Dr. Milsom speaks like a Christian and an artist,' said Bridgers, with sudden cheerfulness. "'If I didn't dope, Van Herden, I should not be working in your beastly factory, but would probably be one of the leading analytical chemists in America. But I'll go back to do my chore,' he said, rising. "'I suppose I get a little commission for restoring your palpitating bride. Milsom tells me that it is she.' I thought it was the other dame, the Dutch girl. I guess I was a bit dopey. Van Herden frowned. You take too keen an interest in my affairs, he said. Ah, oh, you're getting touchy. If I didn't get interested in something, I'd go mad, chuckled Bridgers. He had reached that stage of cocaine intoxication when the world was a very pleasant place indeed, and full of subject for jocularity. "'This place is getting right on my nerves,' he went on. "'Couldn't I go to London? I'm stagnating here. Why, some of the stuff I cultivated the other day wouldn't react. Isn't that so, Milsom? I get so dull in this hole that all bugs look alike to me.' Van Herden glanced at the man who was addressed as Dr. Milsom, and the latter nodded. "'Let him go back,' 
he said. "'I'll look after him.' "'How's the lady?' asked Milsom, when they were alone. The other made a gesture, and Dr. Milsom nodded. "'It's good stuff,' he said. "'I used to give it to lunatics in the days of long ago.' Van Herden did not ask him what those days were. He never pried too closely into the early lives of his associates. But Milsom's history was public property. Four years before, he had completed a life sentence of fifteen years for a crime which had startled the world in ninety-nine. "'How are things generally?' he asked. Van Herden shrugged his shoulders. "'For the first time I am getting nervous,' he said. "'It isn't so much the fear of Beale that rattles me, but the sordid question of money.' The expenses are colossal and continuous. Hasn't your government, Milton balked at the word, haven't your friends abroad moved in the matter yet? Van Herden shook his head. I am very hopeful there, he said. I have been watching the papers very closely, especially the agrarian papers, and unless I am mistaken— there is a decided movement in the direction of support, but I can't depend on that. The marriage must go through to-morrow. White is getting nervous, too, he went on. He is pestering me about the money I owe him, or rather the syndicate owes him. He's on the verge of ruin. Milsom made a little grimace. Then he'll squeal, he said. Those kind of people always do. "'You'll have to keep him quiet. "'You say the marriage is coming off to-morrow?' "'I have notified the parson,' said Van Herden. "'I told him my fiancé is too ill to attend the church, "'and the ceremony must be performed here.' "'Milsom nodded. "'He had risen from the table "'and was looking out upon the pleasant garden "'at the rear of the house. "'A man could do worse than put in three or four weeks here,' he said. Look at that spread of green. He pointed to an expanse of waving grasses, starred with the vari-colored blossoms of wild flowers. I was never a lover of nature, said Van Herden carelessly. Milsom grunted. You have never been in prison, he said cryptically. Is it time to give your lady another dose? Not for two hours, said Van Herden. I will play you at piquet. The cards were shuffled, and the hands dealt, when there was a scamper of feet in the hall. The door burst open, and a man ran in. He was wearing a soiled white smock, and his face was distorted with terror. "'Monsieur, monsieur!' he cried. "'That imbecile Bridgers!' "'What's wrong?' Van Herden sprang to his feet. "'I think he is mad. He is dancing about the grounds, singing—' and he has with him the preparation. Van Herden rapped out an oath and leapt through the door, the doctor at his heels. They took the short cut and ran up the steps leading from the well courtyard, and bursting through the bushes came within sight of the offender. But he was not dancing now. He was standing with open mouth, staring stupidly about him. "'I dropped it! I dropped it!' he stammered. There was no need for Van Herden to ask what he had dropped, for the green lawn which had excited Milsom's admiration was no longer to be seen. In its place was a black, irregular patch of earth which looked as though it had been blasted in the furnaces of hell and the air was filled with the pungent mustiness of decay. End of chapter 18 Recorded by Kirsten Weber Chapter 19 of The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Kirsten Weber THE GREEN RUST by Edgar Wallace CHAPTER Nineteen. Oliva IS WILLING 
It seemed that a grey curtain of mist hung before all of his eyes. It was a curtain spangled with tiny globes of dazzling light, which grew from nothing and faded to nothing. Whenever she fixed her eyes upon one of these, it straightway became two and three, and then an unaccountable quantity. She felt that she ought to see faces of people she knew, for one half of her brain had cleared, and was calmly diagnosing her condition, but doing so as though she were somebody else. She was emerging from a drugged sleep. She could regard herself in a curious, impersonal fashion, which was most interesting, and people who are drugged see things and people. Strange mirages of the mind arise, and stranger illusions are suffered. Yet she saw nothing save this silvery-gray curtain, with its drifting spots of light, and heard nothing except a voice saying, Come along, come along, wake up. A hundred, a thousand times this monotonous order was repeated and then the grey curtain faded, and she was lying on the bed, her head throbbing, her eyes hot and prickly, and two men were looking down at her, one of them a big, bare-faced man, with a coarse mouth and sunken eyes. "'Was it my father, really?' she asked drowsily. "'I was afraid of that second dose you gave her last night,' said Milsom. You are getting a condition of coma, and that's the last thing you want. She'll be all right now, replied Van Herden, but his face was troubled. The dose was severe, yet she seemed healthy enough to stand a three-minim injection. Milsom shook his head. She'll be all right now, but she might as easily have died, he said. I shouldn't repeat the dose. There's no need said Van Herden. "'What time is it?' asked the girl, and sat up. She felt very weak and weary, but she experienced no giddiness. "'It is twelve o'clock. You have been sleeping since seven last night. Let me see if you can stand. Get up.' She obeyed meekly. She had no desire to do anything but what she was told. Her mental condition was one of complete dependence." and had she been left to herself, she would have been content to lie down again. Yet she felt, for a moment, a most intense desire to propound some sort of plan, which would give this man the money without going through a marriage ceremony. That desire lasted a minute, and was succeeded by an added weariness, as though this effort at independent thought had added a new burden to her strength. She knew, and was mildly amazed at the knowledge, that she was under the influence of a drug which was destroying her will, yet she felt no particular urge to make a fight for freedom of determination. Freedom of determination. She repeated these words, having framed her thoughts with punctilious exactness, and remembered that that was a great war phrase which one was constantly discovering in the newspapers. All her thoughts were like this. They had the form of marshalled language, so that even her speculations were punctuated. "'Walk over to the window,' said the doctor, and she obeyed, though her knees gave way with every step she took. "'Now come back. Good. You're all right.' She looked at him, and did not flinch when he laid his two hands on her shoulders. "'You are going to be married this afternoon. That's all right, isn't it?' "'Yes,' she said. "'That is all right.' "'And you'll say yes when I tell you to say yes, won't you?' "'Yes, I'll say that,' she said. All the time she knew that this was monstrously absurd— all the time she knew that she did not wish to marry this man. Fine sentences, pompously framed, slowly formed in her mind, such as, This outrage will not go unpunished, comma, and you will suffer for this, comma, Dr. Van Hadden, full stop. 
but the effort of creating the protest exhausted her, so that she could not utter it, and she knew that the words were stilted and artificial, and that the working cells of her brain whispered that she was recalling and adapting something she had heard at the theatre. She wanted to do the easiest thing, and it seemed absurdly easy to say yes. "'You will stay here until the parson comes,' said Van Herden, "'and you will not attempt to escape, will you?' "'No, I won't attempt to escape,' she said. "'Lie down.' She sat on the bed and swung her feet clear of the ground, settling herself comfortably. "'She'll do,' said Van Herden, satisfied. "'Come downstairs, Milson. I have something to say to you.' So they left her, lying with her cheek on her hand, more absorbed in the pattern on the wallpaper than in the tremendous events which threatened. "'Well, what's the trouble?' asked Milsom, seating himself in his accustomed place by the table. "'This,' said Van Herden, and threw a letter across to him. "'It came by one of my scouts this morning. I didn't go home last night. I cannot risk being shadowed here.' Milsom opened the letter slowly and read. A man called upon you yesterday afternoon and has made several calls since. He was seen by Beale, who cross-examined him. Man calls himself Start, but is apparently not British. He is staying at Saraband Hotel, Berners Street. Who is this? asked Milsom. I dare not hope replied the doctor, pacing the room nervously. "'Suppose you dared. What form would your hope take?' "'I told you the other day,' said Van Herden, stopping before his companion, "'that I had asked my government to assist me. Hitherto they have refused. That is why I am so desperately anxious to get this marriage through. I must have money. The Paddington place costs a small fortune.' "'You go back there to-night, by the way?' Milson nodded. "'Has the government relented?' he asked. "'I don't know. I told you that certain significant items in the East Prussian newspapers seemed to hint that they were coming to my assistance. They have sent no word to me, but if they should agree, they would send their agreement by messenger.' "'And you think this may be the man?' "'It is very likely.' "'What have you done?' "'I have sent Gregory up to see the man. "'If he is what I hope he may be, Gregory will bring him here. "'I have given him the password.' "'What difference will it make?' asked Milsom. "'You are on to a big fortune anyway.' "'Fortune!' "'The eyes of Dr. Van Herden sparkled, "'and he seemed to expand at the splendour of the vision "'which was conjured to his eyes.' "'No fortune which mortal man has ever possessed will be comparable. "'All the riches of all the world will lie at my feet. "'Milliards upon milliards.' "'In fact, a lot of money,' said the practical Dr. Milsom. Um, pff, I don't quite see how you are going to do it. "'You haven't taken me very much into your confidence, Van Herden. "'You know everything.' Milsom chuckled. I know that in the safe of my office you have a thousand sealed envelopes addressed, as I gather, to all the scallywags of the world, and I know pretty well what you intend doing, but how do you benefit, and how do I benefit? Van Herden had recovered his self-possession. You have already benefited, he said shortly, more than you could have hoped. There was an awkward pause. Then Milsom asked, "'What effect is it going to have upon this country?' "'It will ruin England,' said Van Herden, fervently, and the old criminal's eyes narrowed. Umph, he said again, and there was a note in his voice which made Van Herden look at him quickly. "'This country hasn't done very much for you,' he sneered. "'And I haven't done much for this country.' Yet, countered the other, the doctor laughed. You'll turn into a patriot in your old age, he said. 
"'Something like that,' said Milsom easily. "'There used to be a fellow at Portland. You have probably run across him. A clever crook named Homo, who used to be a parson before he got into trouble. I never met the gentleman, and talking of parsons,' he said, looking at his watch, "'our own partly is late, but I interrupted you.' He was a man whose tongue I loathed, and he hated me poisonously, said Milsom, with a little grimace. But he used to say that patriotism was the only form of religion which survived penal servitude. And I suppose that's the case. I hate the thought of putting this country in wrong. You'll get over your scruples, said the other easily. "'You are putting yourself in right, anyway. "'Think of the beautiful time you are going to have, my friend.' "'I think of nothing else,' said Milsom. "'But still,' he shook his head. "'Van Heerden had taken up the paper he had brought down, "'and was reading it, "'and Milsom noted that he was perusing the produce columns. "'When do we make a start?' "'Next week,' said the doctor.' "'I want to finish up the Paddington factory and get away. "'Where will you go?' "'I shall go to the Continent,' replied Van Herden, folding up the paper and laying it on the table. "'I can conduct operations from there with greater ease. "'Gregory goes to Canada. "'Mitchell and Samps have already organized Australia, "'and our three men in India will have ready workers. "'What about the States?' "'That has an organization of its own,' Van Herden said. "'It is costing me a lot of money. "'All the men except you are at their stations waiting for the word go. "'You will take the Canadian supplies with you. "'Do I take Bridger's?' "'Van Herden shook his head. "'I can't trust that fool. "'Otherwise he would be an ideal assistant for you. "'Your work is simple.' "'Before you leave, I will give you a sealed envelope containing a list of all our Canadian agents. "'You will also find two code sentences, one of which means commence operations, "'and the other cancel all instructions and destroy apparatus.' "'Will the latter be necessary?' asked Milsom. "'It may be, so it is very unlikely, but I must provide against all contingencies.' I have made the organization as simple as possible. I have a chief agent in every country, and on receipt of my message by the chief of the organization, it will be repeated to the agents who also have a copy of the code. It seems too easy, said Milsom. What chance is there of detection? None whatever, said the doctor promptly. "'Our only danger for the moment is this man Beale, but he knows nothing, "'and so long as we only have him guessing, there is no great harm done, "'and anyway he hasn't much longer to guess.' "'It seems much too simple,' said Milsom, shaking his head. "'Van Herden had heard a footfall in the hall, stepped quickly to the door, and opened it. "'Well, Gregory?' "'He is here,' replied the other, and waved his hand to a figure who stood behind him. "'Also the parson is coming down the road. "'Good. Let us have our friend in.' The pink-faced foreigner, with his stiff little moustache and his yellow boots, stepped into the room, clicked his heels, and bowed. "'Have I the honour of addressing Dr. von Herden?' "'Van Herden,' corrected the doctor, with a smile. "'That is my name.' Both men spoke in German. "'I have a letter for your excellency,' said the messenger. "'I have been seeking you for many days, and I wish to report that unauthorized persons have attempted to take this from me.' Van Heer nodded, tore open the envelope, and read the half-dozen lines. "'The test word is Breslau,' he said in a low voice, and the messenger beamed. I have the honour to convey to you the word. He whispered something in Van Herden's ear, and Milsom, who did not understand German very well, and had been trying to pick up a word or two, 
saw the look of exultation that came to the doctor's face. He leapt back and threw out his arms, and his strong voice rang with the words which the German hymnal has made famous, Gott sei Dank durch alle Welt, Gott sei Dank durch alle Welt. What are you thanking God about? asked Milsom. It's come, it's come, cried Van Herden, his eyes ablaze. The government is with me, behind me, my beautiful country. Oh, Gott sei Dank. The parson warned Milsom. A young man stood looking through the open door. The parson, yes, said Van Herden. There's no need for it, but we'll have this wedding. Yes, we'll have it. Come in, sir. He was almost boyishly jovial. Milsom had never seen him like that before. Come in, sir. I am sorry to hear your fiancé is ill, said the curate. Yes, yes, but that will not hinder the ceremony. I'll go myself and prepare her. Milsom had walked round the table to the window, and it was he who checked the doctor as he was leaving the room. Doctor, he said, come here. Van Herden detected a strain of anxiety in the other's voice. "'What is it?' he said. "'Do you hear somebody speaking?' They stood by the window and listened intently. "'Come with me,' said the doctor, and he walked noiselessly and ascended the stairs, followed more slowly by his heavier companion. End of chapter 19 Recorded by Kirsten Weber. Chapter Twenty of *The Green Rust* by Edgar Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Kirsten Weber. *The Green Rust* by Edgar Wallace. Chapter Twenty: The Marriage. A quarter of a mile from Dean's Folly. A motor-car was halted on the side of a hill overlooking the valley in which Van Herden's house was set. "'That's the house,' said Beale, consulting the map. "'And that wall that runs along the road is the wall the tramp described. "'You seem to put a lot of face in the statement of a man suffering from delirium tremens,' said Parson Homo dryly. "'He was not suffering from delirium tremens this morning. You didn't see him?' Homo shook his head. "'I was in London, fixing the preliminaries of your nuptials,' he said sarcastically. "'It may be the house,' he admitted. "'There is the entrance. "'There's a road midway between here and the river, and a private road leading off,' said Beale. "'The gate, I presume, is hidden somewhere in those bushes.' He raised a pair of field-glasses and focused them. "'Yes, the gate's there,' he said. "'Do you see that man?' Homo took the glasses and looked. "'Looks like a watcher,' he said. "'And if it is your friend's place, the gate will be locked and barred. "'Why didn't you get a vaunt? Beale shook his head. "'He'd get wind of it and be gone. "'No, our way in is over the wall. "'The hobo said there's a garden door somewhere.' They left the car and walked down the hill, and presently came to a corner of the high wall which surrounded Dean's Folly. Beale passed on ahead. "'Here's the door,' he said. He tried it gingerly, and it gave a little. "'It's clogged, and you won't get it open,' said Homo. "'It's the wall or nothing.' Beale looked up and down the road. There was nobody in sight and he made a leap, caught the top of the wall, and drew himself up. Luckily, the usual chevaux de frise was absent. Beneath him, and a little to the right, was a shed built against the wall, the door of which was closed. He signalled Homo to follow, and dropped to the ground. In a minute, both men were sheltering in the clump of bushes where, on the previous day, Oliver had waited before making a dart for the garden door. "'There's been a fire here,' said Homo in a low voice, and pointed to a big, ugly patch of black amidst the green. 
Beale surveyed it carefully, then wormed his way through the bushes until he was within reach of the ruined plot. He stretched out his hand and pulled in a handful of the debris, examined it carefully, and stuffed it into his pocket. "'You are greatly interested in a grass fire,' said Homo curiously. "'Yes, aren't I?' replied Beale. They spent the next hour reconnoitering the ground. Once the door of the wall shed opened, two men came out and walked to the house, and they had to lie motionless until after a seemingly interminable interval they returned again, stopping in the middle of the black patch to talk. Beale saw one pointing to the ruin, and the other shook his head, and they both returned to the shed, and the door closed behind them. "'There's somebody coming down the main drive,' whispered Homo. They were now near the house, and from where they lay had a clear view of fifty yards of the drive. "'It's a brother brush,' said Homo, in a chuckling whisper. "'A what?' asked Beale. "'A parson. A parson.' He focused his glasses. Someone in clerical attire, accompanied by the man whom Beale recognized as the guard of the gate, was walking quickly down the drive. There was no time to be lost, but now, for the first time, doubts assailed him. His great scheme seemed more fantastic, and its difficulties more real. What could be easier than to spring out and intercept the clergyman, but would that save the girl? What force did the house hold? He had to deal with men who would stop short at nothing to achieve their purpose, and in particular one man who had not hesitated at murder. He felt his heart thumping, not at the thought of danger, though danger he knew was all around, but from sheer panic that he himself was about to play an unworthy part. Whatever fears or doubts he may have had suddenly fell away from him, and he rose to his knees, for not twenty yards away, at a window, her hands grasping the bars, her apathetic eyes looking listlessly toward where he crouched, was Oliver Cresswell. Regardless of danger, he broke cover and ran toward her. "'Miss Cresswell,' he called. She looked at him across the concrete well, without astonishment and without interest. "'It is you,' she said, with extraordinary calm. He stood on the brink of the well, hesitating. It was too far to leap, and he remembered that behind the lilac bush he had seen a builder's plank. This he dragged out, and passed it across the chasm, leaning the other end upon a ledge of brickwork which butted from the house. He stepped quickly across, gripped the bars, and found a foothold on the ledge, the girl standing, watching him, without any sign of interest. He knew something was wrong. He could not even guess what that something was. This was not the girl he knew, but an Oliver Cresswell, from whom all vitality and life had been sapped. "'You know me?' he said. "'I am Mr. Beale.' "'I know you are Mr. Beale,' she replied evenly. "'I have come to save you,' he said rapidly. "'Will you trust me? I want you to trust me,' he said earnestly. I want you to summon every atom of faith you have in human nature and invest it in me. Will you do this for me? I will do this for you, she said, like a child repeating a lesson. I, I want you to marry me. He realized, as he said these words, in what his fear was founded. He knew now that it was her refusal even to go through the form of marriage which he dared not face. The truth leapt up to him and sent the blood pulsing through his head, that behind and beyond his professional care for her, he loved her. He waited with bated breath, expecting her amazement, her indignation, her distress. But she was serene and untroubled, did not so much as raise her eyelids by the fraction of an inch as she answered, "'I will marry you.' He tried to speak, but could only mutter a hoarse, "'Thank you.' He turned his head. Homo stood at the end of the plank, and he beckoned him. Parson Homo came to the centre of the frail bridge, 
slipped a prayer-book from his tail-pocket, and opened it. "'Dearly beloved, we are come together here, in the sight of God, to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony. I require and charge you both, as ye will answer, at the dreadful day of judgment, when the secret of all hearts shall be disclosed, that if either of you know any impediment why ye may not be joined together in matrimony, ye do now confess it. Beale's lips were tight-pressed. The girl was looking serenely upward to a white cloud that sailed across the western skies. Homo read quickly, his enunciation beautifully clear, and Beale found himself wondering when last this man had performed so sacred an office. He asked the inevitable question, and Beale answered. Homo hesitated, then turned to the girl. Wilt thou have this man to be thy wedded husband, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou obey him and serve him, love, honour, and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live? The girl did not immediately answer, and the pause was painful to the two men, but for different reasons. Then she suddenly withdrew her gaze from the sky, and looked Homo straight in the face. "'I will,' she said. The next question in the service he dispensed with. He placed their hands together, and together repeating his words, they plighted their troth. Homo leant forward, and again joined their hands, and a note of unexpected solemnity vibrated in his voice when he spoke. Those whom God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Beale drew a deep breath. Then, very pretty indeed, said a voice. The detective swung across the window to bring the speaker into a line of fire. Put down your gun, admirable Mr. Beale. Van Herden stood in the centre of the room, and the bulky figure of Milsom filled the doorway. "'Very pretty indeed, and most picturesque,' said Van Herden. "'I didn't like to interrupt the ceremony. "'Perhaps you will now come into the house, Mr. Beale, "'and I will explain a few things to you. "'You need not trouble about your wife. "'She will not be harmed.' "'Beale, revolver still in hand, made his way to the door, and was admitted. "'You had better come along, Homo,' he said. We may have to bluff this out. Van Herden was waiting for him in the hall, and invited him no farther. "'You are perfectly at liberty to take away your wife,' said Van Herden. "'She will probably explain to you that I have treated her with every consideration. Here she is.' Oliver was descending the stairs with slow, deliberate steps. "'I might have been very angry with you.' Van Herden went on with that insolent drawl of his. Happily, I do not find it any longer necessary to marry Miss Creswell. I was just explaining to this gentleman, he pointed to the pallid young curate in the background, when your voices reached me. Nevertheless, I think it only right to tell you that your marriage is not a legal one. Though I presume you are provided with a special license— "'Why is it illegal?' asked Beale. He wondered if Parson Homo had been recognized. "'In the first place, because it was not conducted in the presence of witnesses,' said Van Herden. It was Homo who laughed. "'I am afraid that would make it illegal, but for the fact that you witnessed the ceremony by your own confession, and so presumably did your fat friend behind you.' Mr. Milsom scowled. "'You were always a bitter dog to me, Parson,' he said. "'But I can give you a reason why it's illegal,' he said triumphantly. "'That man is Parson Homo, a well-known crook who was kicked out of the church fifteen years ago. I worked alongside him in Portland.' Homo smiled crookedly. "'You are right up to a certain point, Milsom,' he said. "'But you are wrong in one essential.' 
by a curious oversight i was never unfrocked and i am still legally a priest of the church of england heavens gasped beale then this marriage is legal it's as legal as it can possibly be said parson homo complacently End of chapter 20 Recorded by Kirsten Weber Chapter 21 of The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Kirsten Weber The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace Chapter 21 Beale Sees White in a sense, said Lawyer Kitson, it is a tragedy. In a sense, it is a comedy, the most fatal comedy of errors that could be imagined. Stanford Beale sat on a low chair, his head in his hands, the picture of dejection. I don't mind your kicks, he said, without looking up. You can't say anything worse about me than I am saying about myself. "'Oh, I've been a fool, an arrogant, mad fool.' Kitson, his hands clasped behind his back under his tail-coat, his gold-rimmed pince-nez perched on his nose, looked down at the young man. "'I am not going to tell you that I was against the idea from the beginning, because that is unnecessary. I ought to have put my foot down and stopped it. I heard you were pretty clever with a gun, Stanford.' "'Why didn't you sail in and rescue the girl as soon as you found where she was?' "'I don't think there would have been a ghost of a chance,' said the other, looking up. "'I am not finding excuses, but I am telling you what I know. There were four or five men in the house, and they were all pretty tough citizens. I doubt if I would have made it that way. "'You think he would have married her?' "'He admitted as much,' said Stanford Beale. The parson was already there when I butted in. "'What steps are you taking to deal with this man, Van Herden? Beale laughed helplessly. "'I cannot take any until Miss Cresswell recovers.' "'Mrs. Beale,' murmured Kitson, and the other went red. "'I guess we'll call her Miss Cresswell, if you don't mind,' he said sharply. "'See here, Mr. Kitson, you needn't make things worse than they are.' I can do nothing until she recovers, and can give us a statement as to what happened. McNorton will execute the warrant just as soon as we can formulate a charge. In fact, he is waiting downstairs in the hope of seeing—he paused—Miss Cresswell. What does the doctor say? She's sleeping now. It's maddening, maddening, groaned Beale. And yet, if it weren't so horrible, I could laugh. "'Yesterday I was waiting for a hobo to come out of delirium tremens. "'Today I am waiting for Miss Cresswell to recover from some devilish drug. "'I've made a failure of it, Mr. Kitson.' "'I'm afraid you have,' said the other dryly. "'What do you intend doing? "'But does it occur to you,' asked Kitson slowly, "'that this lady is not aware that she has married you "'and that we've got to break the news to her?' "'That's the part I don't like. "'And you can bet it doesn't fill me with rollicking high spirits,' snapped Beale. "'It's a most awful situation.' "'What are you going to do?' asked the other again. "'What are you going to do?' replied the exasperated Beale. "'After all, you're her lawyer.' "'And you're her husband,' said Kitson grimly, "'which reminds me,' he walked to his desk and took up a slip of paper, I drew this out against your coming. This is a certified check for four hundred thousand pounds. That is nearly two million dollars, which I am authorized to hand to Oliver's husband on the day of her wedding. Beale took it from the other's fingers, read it carefully, and tore it into little pieces, after which conversation flagged. After a while, Beale asked, What do I have to do to get a divorce? Well, said the lawyer, by the English law, if you leave your wife and go away and refuse to return to her, she can apply to a judge of the high court who will order you to return within fourteen days. 
"'I'd come back in fourteen seconds if she wanted me,' said Beale fervently. "'You're hopeless,' said Kitson. "'You asked how you could get a divorce. I presume you want one.' "'Of course I do. I want to undo the whole of this horrible tangle. It's absurd and undignified. Can nothing be done without Miss Cresswell knowing?' "'Nothing can be done without your wife's knowledge,' said Kitson. He seemed to take a fiendish pleasure in reminding the unhappy young man of his misfortune. "'I am not blaming you,' he said more soberly. "'I blame myself. When I took this trust from poor John Millenborn, I never realized all that it meant, or all the responsibility it entailed.' How could I imagine that the detective I employed to protect the girl from fortune-hunters would marry her? I am not complaining, he said hastily, seeing the wrath rise in Beale's face. It is very unfortunate, and you are as much the victim of circumstances as I. But, unhappily, we have not been the real victims. I suppose, said Beale, looking up at the ceiling, if I were one of those grand little medieval knights, or one of those gallant gentlemen one reads about, I should blow my brains out. That would be a solution, said Mr. Kitson, but we should still have to explain to your wife that she was a widow. Then what am I to do? Have a cigar, said Kitson. He took two from his vest pocket, and handed one to his companion, and his shrewd old eyes twinkled. "'It's years and years since I read a romantic story,' he said, "'and I haven't followed the trend of modern literature very closely, but I think that your job is to sail in and make the lady love you.' Beale jumped to his feet. "'Do you mean that? Pshaw! It's absurd! It's ridiculous! She would never love me!' "'I don't see why anybody should, least of all your wife.' said Kitson. But it would certainly simplify matters. And then? Marry her all over again, said Kitson, sending a big ring of smoke into the air. There's no law against it. You can marry as many times as you like, providing you marry the same woman. But suppose, suppose she loves somebody else, asked Beale hoarsely. Why, then it will be tough on you, said Kitson but tougher on her. Your business is to see that she doesn't love somebody else. But how? A look of infinite weariness passed across Kitson's face. He removed his glasses and put them carefully into their case. Really, as a detective, he said, you may be a prize exhibit, but as an ordinary human being you wouldn't even get a consolation prize. You have got me into a mess, and you have got to get me out. John Millenborn was concerned only with one thing, the happiness of his niece. If you can make your wife, Mrs. Stanford Beale, Beale groaned. If you can make your good lady happy, said the remorseless lawyer, my trust is fulfilled. I believe you are a white man, Beale, he said with a change in his tone and that her money means nothing to you. I may not be able to give a young man advice as to the best method of courting his wife, but I know something about human nature, and if you are not straight, I have made one of my biggest mistakes. My advice to you is to leave her alone for a day or two, until she's quite recovered. You have plenty to occupy your mind, Go out and fix Van Herden, but not for his treatment of the girl. She mustn't figure in a case of that kind, or all the facts will come out. You think you have another charge against him? Well, prove it. That man killed John Millenborn, and I believe you can put him behind bars. As the guardian angel of Oliver Cresswell, you have shown certain lamentable deficiencies— the smile in his eyes was infectious, and Stanford Beale smiled in sympathy. In that capacity I have no further use for your services, and you are fired. But you can consider yourself re-engaged on the spot to settle with Van Herden. I will pay all the expenses of the chase, but get him. He put out his hand, and Stanford gripped it. 
"'You're a great man, sir,' he breathed. The old man chuckled. "'And you may even be a great detective,' he said. "'In five minutes your Mr. Lassimus White will be here. You suggested I should send for him. Who is he, by the way?' the managing director of punsonby's a friend of van herden's and a shareholder in his great adventure but he knows nothing there was a tap at the door and a page-boy came into the sitting-room with a card show the gentleman up said kitson it is our friend he explained and he may know a great deal said beale Mr. White stalked into the room, dangling his glasses with the one hand and holding his shiny silk hat with the other. He invariably carried his hat as though it were a rifle he were shouldering. He bowed ceremoniously and closed the door behind him. "'Mr. Uh, Kitson,' he said, and advanced a big hand. "'I received your note and am, as you will observe, punctual.' I may say that my favorite motto is punctuality is the politeness of princes. You know Mr. Beale? Mr. White bowed stiffly. I have, ah, uh, met Mr. Beale. In my unregenerate days, said Beale cheerfully, but I am quite sober now. I am delighted to learn this, said Mr. White. I am extremely glad to learn this. "'Mr. Kitson asked you to come, Mr. White, but really it is I who want to see you,' said Beale. "'To be perfectly frank, I learnt that you were in some difficulty.' "'Difficulty?' Mr. White bristled. "'Me, sir, in difficulty, the head of the firm of Punsonby's, whose credit stands, sir, as a model of sound industrial finance? Oh, no, sir.' Beale was taken aback. He had depended upon information which came from unimpeachable sources to secure the cooperation of this pompous windbag. "'I'm sorry,' he said. "'I understood that you had called a meeting of creditors and had offered to sell certain shares in a syndicate which I had hoped to take off your hands.' Mr. White inclined his head graciously. "'It is true, sir,' he said that i asked a few uh wholesale firms to meet me and to talk over things it is also true that i uh had shares which had ceased to interest me but those shares are sold sold has van herden bought them in asked beale eagerly and mr white nodded dr van herden a remarkable man a truly remarkable man he shook his head as if he could not bring himself and never would bring himself to understand how remarkable a man the doctor was dr van herden has repurchased my chairs and they have made me a very handsome profit when was this asked beale i really cannot allow myself to be cross-examined young man he said severely by your accent i perceive that you are of transatlantic origin but i cannot allow you to hustle me hustle i believe is the word the firm of punsonby's forget em said beale tersely punsonby's has been on the verge of collapse for eight years let's get square mr white punsonby's is a one-man company and you're that man its balance sheets are faked, its reserves are non-existent, its sinking fund is spurlos versenkt. Sir, I tell you, I know Punsonby's. I've had the best accountants in London working out your position, and I know you live from hand to mouth, and that the margin between your business and bankruptcy is as near as the margin between you and prison. Mr. White was very pale. But that isn't my business, and I dare say that the money Van Herden paid you this morning will stave off your creditors. Anyway, I'm not running a pure business campaign. I'm running a campaign against your German friend Van Herden. 
"'A German?' said the virtuous Mr. White, in loud astonishment. "'Surely not. A Holland gentleman. "'He's a German, and you know it. "'You've been financing him in a scheme to ruin the greater part of Europe and the United States, "'to say nothing of Canada, South America, India, and Australia. "'I protest against such an inhuman charge,' said Mr. White solemnly, and he rose. "'I cannot stay here any longer. "'If you go, I'll lay information against you,' said Beale. "'I'm in dead earnest, so you can go or stay. First of all, I want to know in what form you received the money.' "'By check," replied White, in a flurry. "'On what bank?' "'The London branch of the Swedland National Bank.' "'A secret branch of the Dresner Bank,' said Beale. "'That's promising. Has Dr. Van Herden ever paid you money before?' By now Mr. White was the most tractable of witnesses. All his old assurances had vanished, and his answers were almost apologetic in tone. "'Yes, Mr. Beale, small sums.' "'On what bank?' "'On my own bank.' "'Good again. Have you ever known that he had an account elsewhere, for example?' You advanced him a very considerable sum of money. Was your check cleared through the Swedland National Bank? No, sir, through my own bank. Beale fingered his chin. Money this morning, and he took his loss in good part. That can only mean one thing, he nodded. Mr. White, you have supplied me with valuable information. I trust I have said nothing which may, ah, uh, incriminate one who has invariably treated me with the highest respect, Mr. White hastened to say. Not more than he is incriminated, smiled Stanford. One more question. You know that Van Herden is engaged in some sort of business, the business in which you invested your money. Where are his factories? But here Mr. White protested he could offer no information. He recalled, not without a sinking of heart, a similar cross-examination on the previous day at the hands of McNorton. There were factories, Van Herden had hinted as much, but as to where they were located, well, confessed Mr. White, he hadn't the slightest idea. "'That's rubbish,' said Beale roughly. "'You know.' Where did you communicate with Van Herden? He wasn't always at his flat, and you only came there twice. I assure you, began Mr. White, alarmed by the other's vehemence. Assure nothing, thundered Beale. Your policies won't sell. Where did you see him? On my honor, let's keep jokes outside the argument, said Beale truculently. Where did you see him? "'Believe me, I never saw him. "'If I had a message to send, my cashier, a uh, Miss Glaum, an admirable young lady, carried it for me.' "'Hilda Glaum!' Beale struck his palm. "'Why had he not thought of Hilda Glaum before?' "'That's about all I want to ask you, Mr. White,' he said mildly. "'You're a lucky man.' "'Lucky, sir,' Mr. White recovered his hauteur, as quickly as Beale's aggressiveness passed. I failed to perceive my fortune. I failed to see, sir, where luck comes in. You have money at your back, said Beale significantly. If you hadn't been pressed for money and had not pressed Van Herden, you would have whistled for it. Do you suggest, demanded White, in his best judicial manner, do you suggest, in the presence of a witness, with a due appreciation of the actionable character of your words, that Dr. Van Herden is a common swindler? Not common, replied Beale. Thank goodness. End of chapter 21 Recorded by Kirsten Weber Chapter Twenty Two of The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Kirsten Weber. 
The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace. Chapter Twenty Two. Hilda Glaum leads the way. Beale had a long consultation with McNorton at Scotland Yard, and on his return to the hotel had his dinner sent up to Kitson's private room and dined amidst a litter of open newspapers. They were representative journals of the past week, and he scanned their columns carefully. Now and again he would cut out a paragraph, and in one case a column. Kitson, who was dining with a friend in the restaurant of the hotel, came up toward nine o'clock, and stood looking with amusement at the detective's silent labors. "'You are making a deplorable litter in my room,' he said. "'But I suppose there is something very mysterious and terrible behind it all. "'Do you mind my reading your cuttings?' "'Go ahead,' said Beale, without raising his eyes from the newspaper. "'Kitson took up a slip and read aloud. "'The reserves of the land bank of the Ukraine have been increased by ten million roubles. "'This increase has very considerably eased the situation in southern Ukraine.' and in Galatia, where there has been considerable unrest amongst the peasants due to the high cost of textiles. "'That is fascinating news,' said Kitson sardonically. "'Are you running a scrapbook on high finance?' "'No,' said the other shortly. "'The land bank is a loan bank. It finances peasant proprietors.' "'You a shareholder?' asked Kitson wonderingly. "'No.' Kitson picked up another cutting. It was a telegraphic dispatch dated from Berlin. As evidence of the healthy industrial tone which prevails in Germany, and the rapidity with which the government is recovering from the effects of the war, I may instance the fact that an order has been placed with the Leipziger Sporwagengesellschaft for sixty thousand boxcars. The order has been placed by the LSG with thirty firms, and the first delivery is due in six weeks. "'That's exciting,' said Kitson, but why cut it out? The next cutting was also dated Berlin, and announced the revival of the War Purchase Council of the old belligerent days as a temporary measure. "'It is not intended,' said the dispatch, "'to invest the committee with all its old functions,' and the step has been taken in view of the bad potato crop to organize distribution. "'What's the joke about that?' asked Kitson, now puzzled. "'The joke is that there is no potato shortage. There never was such a good harvest,' said Beale. "'I keep tag of these things, and I know. The Western Mail has an article from its Berlin correspondent last week saying that potatoes were so plentiful that they were a drug on the market.' Hmm. Did you read about the Zeppelin sheds? asked Beale. You will find it amongst the others. All the old Zepp hangars throughout Germany are to be put in a state of repair and turned into skating rinks for the physical development of young Germany. Wonderful concrete floors are to be laid down, all the dilapidations are to be made good, and the bands will play daily, wet or fine. "'What does it all mean?' asked the bewildered lawyer. "'That the day, the real day, is near at hand,' said Beale soberly. "'War? Against the world, but without the flash of a bayonet or the boom of a cannon. A war fought by men sitting in their little offices and pulling the strings that will choke you and me, Mr. Kitson. Tonight I am going after Van Herden. I may catch him, and yet fail to arrest his evil work. That's a funny word, evil, for everyday people to use, but there's no other like it. Tomorrow, whether I catch him or not, I will tell you the story of the plot I accidentally discovered. The British government thinks that I have got on the track of a big thing, so does Washington, and I'm having all the help I want. It's a queer world, said Kitson. It may be queerer, responded Beale. Then, boldly, how is my wife? Your, well, I like your nerve, gasped Kitson. I thought you preferred it that way. How is Miss Cresswell? 
The nurse says she's doing famously. She is sleeping now, but she woke up for food, and is nearly normal. She did not ask for you, he added pointedly. Beale flushed and laughed. My last attempt to be merry, he said. I suppose that to-morrow she will be well. But not receiving visitors, Kitson was careful to warn him. You will keep your mind off, Oliver, and keep your eye fixed on Van Herden, if you are wise. No man can serve two masters. Stanford Beale looked at his watch. It is the hour, he said oracularly, and got up. "'I'll leave this untidiness for your man to clear,' said Kitson. "'Where do you go now?' "'To see Hilda Glaum, if the fates are kind,' said Beale. "'I'm going to put up a bluff, believing that, in her panic, she will lead me into the lion's den, with the idea of Van Herden making one mouthful of me. I've got to take that risk. If she is what I think she is, she'll lay a trap for me.' I'll fall for it, but I'm going to get next to Van Herden to-night. Kitson accompanied him to the door of the hotel. Take no unnecessary risks, he said at parting. Don't forget that you're a married man. That's one of the things I want to forget, if you'll let me, said the exasperated young man. Outside the hotel he hailed a passing taxi and was soon speeding through Piccadilly westward. He turned by Hyde Park Corner, skirted the grounds of Buckingham Palace, and plunged into the maze of Pimlico. He pulled up before a dreary-looking house in a blank and dreary street, and, telling the cabman to wait, mounted the steps and rang the bell. A diminutive maid opened the door. "'Is Miss Glaum in?' he demanded. "'Yes, sir. Will you step into the drawing-room?' All the other boarders are out. What name shall I say? Tell her a gentleman from Crewman Mansions, he answered diplomatically. He walked into the tawdry parlour and put down his hat and stick and waited. Presently the door opened and the girl came in. She stopped, open-mouthed with surprise at the sight of him, and her surprise deepened to suspicion. I thought, she began and checked herself, "'You thought I was Dr. Van Herden? Well, I'm not.' "'You're the man I saw at Hyla's,' she said, glowering at him. "'Yes, my name is Beale. "'Oh, I've heard about you. You'll get nothing by prying here,' she cried. "'I shall get a great deal by prying here, I think,' he said calmly. "'Sit down, Miss Hilda Glaum, and let us understand one another. "'You are a friend of Dr. Van Herden's?' "'I shall answer no questions,' she snapped. "'Perhaps you will answer this question,' he said. "'Why did Dr. Van Herden secure an appointment for you at Ponsonby's, and why, when you were there, did you steal three registered envelopes which you conveyed to the doctor?' Her face went red and white. "'That's a lie,' she gasped. "'You might tell a judge and jury that, and then they wouldn't believe you,' he smiled. "'Come, Miss Glaum, let us be absolutely frank with one another. I am telling you that I don't intend bringing your action to the notice of the police, and you can give me a little information which will be very useful to me.' "'It's a lie,' she repeated, visibly agitated. "'I did not steal anything. If Miss Creswell says so—' "'Miss Cresswell is quite ignorant of your treachery,' said the other quietly. "'But as you are determined to deny that much, perhaps you will tell me this. "'What business brings you to Dr. Van Herden's flat in the small hours of the morning?' "'Do you insinuate?' "'I insinuate nothing. "'And least of all do I insinuate that you have any love affair with the doctor "'who does not strike me as that kind of person.' Her eyes narrowed, and for a moment it seemed that her natural vanity would overcome her discretion. "'Who says I go to Dr. Van Herden's?' "'I say so, because I have seen you. Surely you don't forget that I live opposite the amiable doctor?' "'I am not going to discuss my business or his,' she said, "'and I don't care what you threaten me with or what you do.' "'I will do something more than threaten you,' he said ominously. 
"'You will not fool me, Miss Glaum, and the sooner you realize the fact, the better. I am going all the way with you, if you give me any trouble, and if you don't answer my questions. I might tell you that, unless this interview is a very satisfactory one to me, I shall not only arrest Dr. Van Herden to-night, but I shall take you as an accomplice.' "'You can't! You can't!' she almost screamed the words. All the sullen restraint fell away from her, and she was electric in the violence of her protest. "'Arrest him! That wonderful man! Arrest me! You dare not! You dare not! I shall dare do lots of things, unless you tell me what I want to know. What do you want to know?' she demanded defiantly. "'I want to know the most likely address at which your friend the doctor can be found.' The fact is, Miss Glaum, the game is up. We know all about the green rust. She stepped back, her hand raised to her mouth. The, the green rust, she gasped. What do you mean? I mean that I have every reason to believe that Dr. Van Herden is engaged in a conspiracy against this state. He has disappeared, but is still in London. I want to take him quietly, without fuss. Her eyes were fixed on his. He saw doubt, rage, a hint of fear, and finally a steady light of resolution shining. When she spoke, her voice was calm. "'Very good. I will take you to the place,' she said. She went out of the room and came back five minutes later with her hat and coat on. "'It's a long way,' she began. I have a taxi at the door. We cannot go all the way by taxi. Tell the man to drive to Baker Street, she said. She spoke no word during the journey, nor was Beale inclined for conversation. At Baker Street station they stopped, and the cab was dismissed. Together they walked in silence, turning from the main road, passing the central station, and plunging into a labyrinth of streets which was foreign territory to the American. It seemed that he had passed in one step from one of the best-class quarters of the town to one of the worst. One minute he was passing through a sedate square lined with the houses of well-to-do. Another minute he was in a slum. "'This place is at the end of the street,' she said. They came to what seemed to be a stable-yard. There was a blank wall with one door and a pair of gates. The girl took a key from her bag, opened the small door, and stepped in, and Beale followed. They were in a yard littered with casks. On two sides of the yard ran low-roofed buildings, which had apparently been used as stables. She locked the door behind her, walked across the yard to the corner, and opened another door. "'There are fourteen steps down,' she said. "'Have you a light of any kind?' He took his electric torch from his pocket. "'Give it to me,' she said. "'I will lead the way.' "'What is this place?' he asked, after she had locked the door. "'It used to be a vine merchant's,' she said shortly. "'We have the cellars.' "'We?' Oui, he repeated. She made no reply. At the bottom of the steps was a short passage, and another door, which was opened, and apparently the same key fitted them all, or else, as Beale suspected, she carried a pass-key. They walked through, and again she closed the door behind them. Another, he said, as her light flashed upon a steel door a dozen paces ahead. It is the last one, she said, and went on. Suddenly the light was extinguished. Your lamp's gone wrong, he heard her say, but I can find the lock. He heard a click, but did not see the door open, and did not realize what had happened until he heard a click again. The light was suddenly flashed on him, level with his eyes. "'You can't see me,' said a mocking voice. "'I'm looking at you through the little spy-hole. Did you see the spy-hole, clever Mr. Beale?' "'I am on the other side of the door,' he heard her laugh. "'Are you going to arrest the doctor to-night?' she mocked. "'Are you going to discover the secret of the green rust? Ah, that is what you want, isn't it?' "'My dear little friend,' said Beale, smoothly, "'you will be very sensible and open that door. "'You don't suppose that I came here alone. "'I was shadowed all the way.' "'You lie,' she said coolly. 
Why did I dismiss the cab and make you walk? Oh, clever Mr. Bill! He chuckled, though he was in no chuckling mood. What a sense of humor, he said admiringly. Now just listen to me. He made one stride to the door, his revolver had flicked out of his hip pocket, when he heard the snap of a shutter and the barrel that he thrust between the bars met steel. Then came the grind of bolts, and he pocketed his gun. So that's that, he said. Then he walked back to the other door, struck a match, and examined it. It was sheathed with iron. He tapped the walls with his stick, but found nothing to encourage him. The floor was solidly flagged, the low roof of the passage was vaulted and cased with stone. He stopped in his search suddenly and listened. Above his head he heard a light patter of feet and smiled. It was his boast that he never forgot a voice or a footfall. "'That's my little friend on her way back, running like the deuce to tell the doctor,' he said. I have something under an hour before the shooting starts. End of chapter 22 Recorded by Kirsten Weber Chapter 23 of The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Kirsten Weber the green rust by edgar wallace chapter twenty three at the doctor's flat dr van herden did not hurry his departure from his staines house he spent the morning following oliva's marriage in town transacting certain important business and making no attempt to conceal his comings and goings though he knew that he was shadowed Yet he was well aware that every hour that passed brought danger nearer. He judged, and rightly, that his peril was not to be found in the consequences of his detention of Oliver Cresswell. "'I may have a week's grace,' he said to Milsom, "'and in the space of a week I can do all that I want.' He spent the evening superintending the dismantling of apparatus in the shed, and it was past ten o'clock on Tuesday before he finished. It was not until he was seated by Milsom's side in the big limousine and the car was running smoothly through Kingston that he made any further reference to the previous afternoon. Is Bill content? Eh? Milsom, dozing in a corner of the car, awoke with a start. Is Bill content with his prize and his predicament? asked Van Herden. "'Well, I guess he should be. That little job brings him a million. He shouldn't worry about anything further.' But Van Herden shook his head. "'I don't think you have things quite right, Milsom,' he said. "'Bill is a better man than I thought, and knows my mind a little too well. He was astounded when Homo claimed to be a priest. I never saw a man more stunned in my life.' He intended the marriage as a bluff to keep me away from the girl. He analyzed the situation exactly, for he knew I was after her money, and that she, as a woman, had no attraction for me. He believed, and there he was justified, that if I could not marry her I had no interest in detaining her, and engaged Homo to follow him around with a special license. He timed everything too well for my comfort." Milsom shifted round and peered anxiously at his companion. "'How do you mean?' he asked. "'It was only by a fluke that he made it in time.' "'That isn't what I mean. It is the fact that he knew that every second was vital, that he guessed I was keen on a quick marriage, and that to forestall me he carried his, as he thought, pseudo-clergyman with him, so that he need not lose a minute.' These are disturbing factors. I don't see it, said Milsom. The fellow's a crook. All these Yankee detectives are grafters. He saw a chance of a big rake-off and took it. Fifty-fifty of a million fortune is a fine commission. You're wrong. I'd like to think as you do. Man, can't you see that his every action proves that he knows all about the green rust? Eh? Milsom sat up. 
"'How, what makes you say that? "'It's clear enough. "'He has already some idea of the scheme. "'He has been pumping old Hyla. "'He even secured a sample of the stuff. "'It was a faulty cultivation, "'but it might have been enough for him. "'He surmised that I had a special use "'for old Millenborn's money, "'and why I was in a hurry to get it.' The silence which followed lasted several minutes. "'Does anybody except Beale know? If you settled him?' "'We should have to finish him to-night,' said Van Herden. "'That is what I have been thinking about all day.' Another silence. "'Well, why not?' asked Milsom. "'It is all one to me. The stake is worth a little extra risk.' "'It must be done before he finds the Peddington place. "'That is the danger which haunts me. "'Van Herden was uneasy, "'and he had lost the note of calm assurance "'which ordinarily characterized his speech. "'There is sufficient evidence there to spoil everything.' "'There is that,' breathed Milsom. "'It was madness to go on. "'You have all the stuff you want. "'You could have closed down the factory a week ago.' "'I must have a margin of safety. "'Besides, how could I do anything else? "'I was nearly broke at any sign of closing down "'would have brought my hungry workers to Crumman Mansions.' "'That's true,' agreed the doctor. "'I've had to stall em off, "'but I didn't know that it was because you were broke. "'It seemed to me just a natural reluctance "'to part with good money.' Further conversation was arrested by the sudden stoppage of the car. Van Herden peered through the window ahead, and caught a glimpse of a red lamp. "'It is all right,' he said. "'This must be Putney Common, and I told Gregory to meet me with any news.' A man came into the rays of the headlamp, and passed to the door. "'Well,' asked the doctor, "'is there any trouble?' "'I saw the green lamp on the bonnet,' said Gregory. Milsom no longer wondered how the man had recognized the car from the score of others which pass over the common. "'There is no news of importance.' "'Where is Beale?' "'At the old man's hotel. He has been there all day.' "'Has he made any further visits to the police?' "'He was at Scotland Yard this afternoon.' "'And the young lady?' "'One of the waiters at the hotel, a friend of mine, told me that she is much better. She has had two doctors.' "'And still lives,' said the cynical Milsom. "'That makes four doctors she has seen in two days.' Van Herden leant out of the car window and lowered his voice. "'The Fräulein Glaum, you saw her?' "'Yes, I told her that she must not come to your laboratory again until you sent for her. She asked when you leave.' "'That she must not know, Gregory, please remember.' He withdrew his head, tapped at the window, and the car moved on. "'There's another problem for you, Van Herden,' said Milsom, with a chuckle. "'What?' demanded the other sharply. "'Hilda Glaum. I've only seen the girl twice or so, but she adores you. What are you going to do with her?' Van Herden lit a cigarette, and in the play of the flame Milson saw him smiling. "'She comes on after me,' he said, "'by which I mean that I have a place for her in my country, but not—' "'Not the sort of place she expects,' finished Milsom bluntly. "'You may have trouble there. Bah!' "'That's foolish,' said Milsom. The convict establishments of England are filled with men who say bah when they were warned against jealous women. If, he went on, if you could eliminate jealousy from the human outfit, you'd have half the prison warders of England unemployed. Hilda is a good girl, said the other complacently. She also is a good German girl, and in Germany women know their place in the system. She will be satisfied with what I give her. There aren't any women like that, said Milsom, with decision, and the subject dropped. The car stopped near the marble arch to put down Milsom, and Van Herden continued his journey alone, reaching his apartments a little before midnight. As he stepped out of the car, a man strolled across the street. It was Beale's watcher. Van Herden looked round with a smile. 
realizing the significance of this nonchalant figure, and passed through the lobby and up to the stairs. He had left his lights full on for the benefit of watchers, and the hall lamp glowed convincingly through the fanlight. Beale's flat was in darkness, and a slip of paper fastened to the door gave his address. The doctor let himself into his own rooms, closed the door, switched out the light, and stepped into his bureau. Hello, he said angrily. What are you doing here? I told you not to come. The girl who was sitting at the table, and who now rose to meet him, was breathless, and he read trouble in her face. He could have read pride there, too, that she had so well served the man whom she idolized as a god. "'I've got him! I've got him, Julius!' "'Got him! Got whom?' he asked, with a frown. "'Biel!' she said eagerly. "'The great Biel!' she gurgled with hysterical laughter. "'He came to me. He was going to arrest me to-night, but I got him.' "'Sit down,' he said firmly and try to be coherent hilda who came to you bill he came to my boarding-house and wanted to know where you had taken oliver cresswell have you taken her she asked earnestly go on he said he came to me full of arrogance and threats he was going to have me arrested julius because of those letters which i gave you but i didn't worry about myself julius it was all for you that i thought the thought that you my dear great man should be put in one of these horrible english prisons oh julius she rose her eyes filled with tears but he stood over her laid his hands on her shoulders and pressed her back now now you must tell me everything this is very serious what happens then he wanted me to take him to one of the places one of what places he asked quickly i don't know he only said that he knew that you had other houses i don't even know that he said that but that was the impression that he gave me that he knew you were to be found somewhere go on said the doctor and so i thought and i thought said the girl her hands clasped in front of her her eyes looking up into his and i prayed god would give me some idea to help you and then the scheme came to me, Julius. I said I would lead him to you. You said you would lead him to me, he said steadily. And where did you lead him? To the factory in Paddington, she said. There, he stared at her. Wait, 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 she said. Oh, please don't blame me. I took him into the passage with the doors. I borrowed his light and after we had passed and locked the second door i slipped through the third and slammed it in his face then he is there caught oh julius did i do well please don't be angry with me i was so afraid for you how long have you been here he asked not ten minutes perhaps five minutes i don't know i have no knowledge of time i came straight back to see you he stood by the table, gnawing his finger, his head bowed in concentrated thought. "'There, of all places,' he muttered, "'there, of all places.' "'Oh, Julius, I did my best,' she said tearfully. He looked down at her with a little sneer. "'Of course you did your best. You're a woman, and you haven't brains.' "'I thought you sought,' he sneered. "'Who told you you could sink, you fool? "'Don't you know it was a bluff, "'that he could no more arrest me than I could arrest him? "'Don't you realize? "'Did he know you were in the habit of coming here?' "'She nodded. "'I thought so,' said Van Herden with a bitter laugh. "'He knows you are in love with me, "'and he played upon your fears. "'You poor little fool! "'Don't cry, or I shall do something unpleasant.' there there help yourself to some wine you will find it in the tantalus he strode up and down the room there's nothing to be done but to settle accounts with mr beale he said grimly do you think he was watched oh no julius no she checked her sobs i was so careful she gave him a description of the journey and the precautions she had taken 
"'Well, perhaps you're not such a fool after all.' He unlocked a drawer in his desk and took out a long-barreled browning pistol, withdrew the magazine from the butt, examined and replaced it, and slipped back the cover. "'Yes, I think I must settle accounts with this gentleman, but I don't want to use this.' he added thoughtfully, as he pushed up the safety catch and dropped the weapon in his pocket. We might be able to gas him. Anyway, you can do no more good or harm, he said cynically. She was speechless. Her hands, clasped tightly at her breast, covered a damp ball of handkerchief, and her tear-stained face was upturned to his. Now dry your face. He stooped and kissed her lightly on the cheek. "'Perhaps what you have done is the best after all. Who knows? Anyway,' he said, speaking his thoughts aloud, "'Bill knows about the green rust, and it can't be very long before I have to go to earth, but only for a little time, my Hilda.' He smiled, showing his white teeth, but it was not a pleasant smile. "'Only for a little time, and then,' he threw up his arms, we shall be rich beyond the dreams of frankfort you will succeed i know you will succeed julius she breathed if i could only help you if you would only tell me what you are doing what is the green rust is it some new wonderful explosive dry your face and go home he said shortly you will find a detective outside the door watching you but i do not think he will follow you he dismissed the girl and followed her after an interval of time striding boldly past the shadow and gaining the cab-stand in shaftesbury avenue without so far as he could see being followed but he dismissed the cab in the neighbourhood of baker street and continued his journey on foot he opened the little door leading into the yard but did not follow the same direction as the girl had led stanford beale it was through another door that he entered the vault, which at one time had been the innocent repository of bubbling life, and was now the factory where men worked diligently for the destruction of their fellows. End of chapter 23 Recorded by Kirsten Weber Chapter Twenty Four of the Green Rust by Edgar Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Kirsten Weber. The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace. Chapter Twenty Four The Green Rust Factory. Stanford Beale spent a thoughtful three minutes in the darkness of the cellar passage to which Hilda Glaum had led him and then he began a careful search of his pockets. He carried a little silver cigar lighter, which had fortunately been charged with petrol that afternoon, and this afforded him a beam of adequate means to take note of his surroundings. The space between the two locked doors was ten feet, the width of the passage three, the height about seven feet. The roof, as he had already noted, was vaulted, now he saw that along the centre ran a strip of beading there had evidently been an electric light installation here probably before the new owners took possession for at intervals was a socket for an electric bulb the new occupants had covered these and the rest of the wall with whitewash and yet the beading and the electric fittings looked comparatively new one wall that on his left as he had come in revealed nothing under his close inspection but on the right wall midway between the two doors there had been a notice painted in white letters on a black background and this showed faintly through the thick coating of distemper which had been applied he damped a handkerchief with his tongue and rubbed away some of the whitewash where the letters were least legible and read a i d new line l t e r period new line dash 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 new line u l a n new line c e ampersand 
new line, T space A I D period. This was evidently half an inscription which had been cut off exactly in the middle. To the left there was no sign of lettering. He puzzled the letters for a few moments before he came to an understanding. Air raid shelter, ambulance and first aid, he read. So that explained the new electric fittings. It was one of those underground cellars which had been ferreted out by the municipality or the government for the shelter of the people in the neighborhood during air raids in the Great War. Evidently there was extensive accommodation here, since this was also an ambulance post. Faintly discernible beneath the letters was a painted white hand, which pointed downward. What had happened to the other half of the inscription? Obviously it had been painted on the door leading into the first aid room, and as obviously that door had been removed and had been bricked up. In the light of this discovery, he made a more careful inspection of the wall to the left. For the space of four feet the brickwork was new. He tapped it. It sounded hollow. Pressing his back against the opposite wall to give him leverage, he put his foot against the new brickwork and pushed. He knew that the class of workmanship which was put into this kind of job was not of the best, that only one layer of brick was applied and it was a mechanical fact that pressure applied to the center of new work would produce a collapse. At the first push he felt the wall sag. Releasing his pressure it came back. This time he put both feet against the wall, and bracing his shoulders he put every ounce of strength in his body into a mighty heave. The next second he was lying on his back. The greater part of the wall had collapsed. He was curious enough to examine the work he had demolished. It had evidently been done by amateurs, and the whitewash, which had been thickly applied to the passage, was explained. A current of fresh air came to meet him as he stepped gingerly across the debris. A flight of six stone steps led down to a small room containing a sink and a water supply two camp beds, which had evidently been part of the ambulance equipment, and which the new owners had not thought necessary to remove, and a broken chair. The room was still littered with the paraphernalia of first aid. He found odd ends of bandages, empty medicine bottles, and a broken glass measure on the shelf above the sink. What interested him more was a door which he had not dared to hope he would find, it was bolted on his side, and when he slid this back he discovered, to his relief, that it was not locked. He opened it carefully, first extinguishing his light. Beyond the door was darkness, and he snapped back the light again. The room led to another, likewise empty. There were a number of shelves, a few old wine bins, a score of empty bottles, but nothing else. At the far corner was yet another door, also bolted on the inside. Evidently Van Herden did not intend this part of the vault to be used. He looked at the lock, and found it was broken. He must be approaching the main workroom in this new factory, and it was necessary to proceed with caution. He took out his revolver, spun the cylinder, and thrust it under his waistcoat, the butt ready to hand. The drawing of the bolts was a long business. He could not afford to risk detection at this hour, and could only move them by a fraction of an inch at a time. Presently his work was done, and he pulled the door cautiously. Instantly there appeared between door and jam a bright green line of light. He dared not move it any farther, for he heard now the shuffle of feet, and occasionally the sound of hollow voices muffled and indistinguishable. In that light the opening of the door would be seen, perhaps by a dozen pair of eyes. For all he knew, every man in that room might be facing his way. He had expected to hear the noise of machinery, but beyond the strangled voices, 
Occasionally the click of glass against glass, and the shuff, shuff, shuff of slippered feet crossing the floor, he heard nothing. He pulled the door another quarter of an inch, and glued his eye to the crack. At this angle he could only see one of the walls of the big vault, and the end of a long vapour lamp, which stood in one of the cornices, and which supplied the ghastly light. But presently he saw something which filled him with hope. Against the wall was a high shadow, which even the overhead lamp did not wholly neutralize. It was an irregular shadow, such as a stack of boxes might make, and it occurred to him that perhaps beyond his range of vision there was a barricade of empty cases which hid the door from the rest of the room. He spent nearly three-quarters of an hour taking a bearing based upon the problematical position of the lights, the height and density of the box screen, and then boldly and rapidly opened the door, stepped through, and closed it behind him. His calculations had been accurate. He found himself in a room, the extent of which he could only conjecture. What, however, interested him mostly was the accuracy of his calculation that the door was hidden. An L-shaped stack of crates was piled within two feet of the ceiling, and formed a little lobby to anybody entering the vault the way Beale had come. They were stacked neatly and methodically, and with the exception of two larger packing cases, which formed the cornerstone, the barrier was made of a large number of small boxes, about ten inches square. There was a small step-ladder, evidently used by the person whose business it was to keep the stack in order. Beale lifted it noiselessly, planted it against the corner, and mounted cautiously. He saw a large, broad chamber, its groined roof supported by six squat stone pillars, Light came not only from the mercurial lamps affixed to the ceiling, but from others suspended above the three rows of benches which ran the length of the room. Mercurial lamps do not give a green light, as he knew, but a violet light, and the green effect was produced by shades of something which Beale thought was yellow silk, but which he afterward discovered was tinted mica. At intervals along the benches sat white-clad figures, their faces hidden behind rubber masks, their hands covered with gloves. In front of each man was a small microscope under a glass shade, a pair of balances, and a rack filled with shallow porcelain trays. Evidently the work on which they were engaged did not endanger their eyesight, for the eyepieces in the masks were innocent of protective covering, a circumstance which added to the hideous animal-like appearance of the men. They all looked alike in their uniform garb, but one figure alone Beale recognized. There was no mistaking the stumpy form and the big head of the Herr Professor whose appearance in Oliver Cresswell's room had so terrified that young lady. He had expected to see him, for he knew that this old German, poverty-stricken and ill-favoured, had been roped in by Van Herden, and Beale, who pitied the old man, had been engaged for a fortnight in trying to worm from the ex-professor of chemistry at the University of Heidelberg the location of Van Herden's secret laboratory. His efforts had been unsuccessful. There was a streak of loyalty in the old man, which had excited an irritable admiration in the detective, but had produced nothing more. Beale's eyes followed the benches, and took in every detail. Some of the men were evidently engaged in tests, and remained all the time with their eyes glued to their microscopes. Others were looking into their porcelain trays, and stirring the contents with glass rods, now and again transferring something to a glass slide, which was placed on the microscope and earnestly examined. Beale was conscious of a faint, musty odour permeating the air, an indescribable earthy smell with a tang to it, which made the delicate membrane of the nostrils smart and ache. 
he tied his handkerchief over his nose and mouth before he took another peep. Only part of the room was visible from his post of observation. What was going on immediately beneath the far side of the screen he could only conjecture. But he saw enough to convince him that this was the principal factory, from whence Van Herden was distilling the poison with which he planned humanity's death. Some of the workers were filling and sealing small test-tubes with the contents of dishes. These tubes were extraordinarily delicate of structure, and Beale saw at least three crumble and shiver in the hands of the fillers. Every bench held a hundred or so of these tubes, and a covered gas-jet for heating the wax. The work went on methodically, with very little conversation between the masked figures, he saw that the masks covered the heads of the chemists so that not a vestige of their hair showed, and only occasionally did one of them leave his seat and disappear through a door at the far end of the room, which apparently led to a canteen. Evidently the fumes against which they were protected were not virulent, for some of the men stripped their masks as soon as they left their benches. For half an hour he watched and in the course of that time saw the process of filling the small boxes which formed his barrier and hiding-place with the sealed tubes. He observed the care with which the fragile tubes were placed in their beds of cotton wool, and had a glimpse of the lined interior of one of the boxes. He was on the point of lifting down a box to make a more thorough examination, when he heard a quavering voice beneath him. "'What do you do here, eh?' Under the step-ladder was one of the workers who had slipped noiselessly round the corner of the pile, and now stood, grotesque and menacing, his uncovered eyes glowering at the intruder, the black barrel of his browning pistol covering the detective's heart. "'Don't shoot, Colonel,' said Beale softly. "'I'll come down.'" End of chapter 24 Recorded by Kirsten Weber Chapter 25 of The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Kirsten Weber The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace Chapter 25 The Last Man at the Bench After all, it was for the best. Van Herden could almost see the hand of Providence in this deliverance of his enemy into his power. There must be a settlement with Beale, that play-acting drunkard who had so deceived him at first. Dr. Van Herden could admire the ingenuity of his enemy, and could kill him. He was a man whose mental poise permitted the paradox of detached attachments. At first he had regarded Stanford Beale as a smart police officer the sort of man whom Pinkerton and Burns turn out by the score. Shrewd, assertive, indefatigable, such men piece together the scattered mosaics of humdrum crimes, and by their mechanical patience produce for the satisfaction of courts sufficient of the piece to reveal the design. They figure in divorce suits, in financial swindles, and occasionally in more serious cases. Van Herden knew instinctively their limitations, and had too hastily placed Beale in a lower category than he deserved. Van Herden came to his workroom, by way of the buffet which he had established for the use of his employees. As he shut the steel door behind him, he saw Milsom standing at the rough wooden sideboard, which served as bar and table for the workers. "'This is an unexpected pleasure,' said Milsom, and then quickly, as he read the other's face, "'Anything wrong?' If the fact that the cleverest policeman in America or England is at present on the premises can be so described, then everything is wrong, said Van Herden, and helped himself to a drink. Here, in the laboratory, demanded Milsom, fear in his eyes, what do you mean? I'll tell you, said the other, and gave the story as he had heard it from Hilda Glaum. He's in the old passage, eh? said Milsom, thoughtfully. "'Well, there's no reason why he should get out. Alive.' "'He won't,' said the other. "'Was he followed? You saw nobody outside.' 
"'We have nothing to fear on that score. He's working on his own.' Milsom grunted. "'What are we going to do with him?' "'Gas him,' said Van Herden. "'He is certain to have a gun.' Milsom nodded. "'Wait until the men have gone. I let them go at three, a few at a time. And it wants half an hour to that. He can wait. He's safe where he is. Why didn't Hilda tell me? I never even saw her.' "'She went straight up from the old passage, through the men's door. She didn't trust you, probably.' Milsom smiled wryly. Though he controlled these works, and knew half the doctor's secrets, he suspected that the quantity of Van Herden's trust was not greatly in excess of his girl's. "'We'll wait,' he said again. "'There's no hurry, and, anyway, I want to see you about old man Hyler. "'Von Hyler? I thought you were rid of him.' said Van Herden, in surprise. "'That is the old fool that Beale has been after. He has been trying to suck him dry, and has had two interviews with him. I told you to send him to Dean's Folly. Bridgers would have taken care of him.' "'Bridgers can look after nothing,' said Milsom. His eyes roved along the benches, and stopped at a worker at the farther end of the room. "'He's quiet to-night,' he said. That fellow is too full of himself for my liking. Earlier in the evening, before I arrived, he pulled a gun on Schultz. He's too full of gunplay, that fellow. Excuse the idiom. But I was in the same tailor's shop at Portland Jail as Ned Garand, bank smasher. Van Herden made a gesture of impatience. About old Hyler, Milsom went on. I know you think he's dangerous, so I've kept him here. There's a room where he can sleep, and he can take all the exercise he wants at night. But the old fool is restless, and he's been asking me what is the object of this work. He's difficult. Twice he has nearly betrayed me. As I told you in the car, I gave him some experimental work to do, and he brought the result to me. That was the sample which fell into Beale's hands. Mr. Beale is certainly a danger, said Milsom thoughtfully. Van Herden made a move toward the laboratory, but Milsom's big hand detained him. "'One minute, Van Herden,' he said. "'Whilst you're here, you'd better decide when do we start dismantling. I've got to find some excuse to send these fellows away.' Van Herden thought. "'In two days,' he said. "'That will give you time to clear. You can send the men, well, send them to Scotland, some out-of-the-way place where news doesn't travel.' Tell them we are opening a new factory, and put them up in a local hotel. Milsom inclined his head. That sounds easy, he said. I could take charge of them until the time came to skip. One can get a boat at Greenock. I shall miss you, said Van Herden frankly. You were necessary to me, Milsom. You're the driving force I wanted, and the only man of my class and calibre I can ever expect to meet. "'one who would go into this business with me.' They had reached the big vault, and Van Herden stood regarding the scene of mental activity with something approaching complacency. "'There is a billion in process of creation,' he said. "'I could never think in more than six figures,' said Milsom. "'And it is only under your cheering influence that I can stretch to seven. I am going to live in the Argentine, Van Herden, a house on a hill.' The other shivered, but Milsom went on. A gorgeous palace of a house, alive with servants. A string band, a perfectly equipped laboratory where I can indulge my passion for research. A high-powered auto. Wine of the rarest. Ah! Van Herden looked at his companion curiously. That appears to you, does it? For me, the control of finance. Endless schemes of fortune. Endless smashings of rivals, railways, ships, great industries, juggled and shuffled. That is the life I plan. Fine, said the other laconically. They walked to a bench, and the worker looked up and took off his mask. He was an old man, and grinned toothlessly at Van Herden. Good evening, Signor Doctor, he said in Italian. Science is long and life is short, Signor. He chuckled, and, resuming his mask, returned to his work, ignoring the two men as though they had no existence. "'A little mad, old Castelli,' said Milsom. 
"'That's his one little piece. What crooked thing has he done?' "'None that I know,' said the other carelessly. "'He lost his wife and two daughters in the Messina earthquake. I picked him up cheap. He's a useful chemist.' They walked from bench to bench, but Van Herden's eyes continuously strayed to the door behind which he pictured a caged Stanford Beale, awaiting his doom. The men were beginning to depart now. One by one they covered their instruments and their trays, slipped off their masks and overalls, and disappeared through the door upon which Van Herden's gaze was so often fixed. Their exit, however, would not take them near Beale's prison, a few paces along the corridor was another passage leading to the yard above, and it was by this way that Hilda Glaum had sped to the doctor's room. Presently all were gone, save one industrious worker who sat peering through the eyepiece of his microscope, immovable. "'That's our friend Bridgers,' said Milsom. "'He's all lit up with the alkaloid of Anthroxylon coca. "'Well, Bridgers, nearly finished?' "'Huh!' grunted the man without turning milsom shrugged his shoulders we must let him finish what he's doing he is quite oblivious to the presence of anybody when he has these fits of industry by the way the passing of our dear enemy he jerked his head to the passage door will make no change in your plans how you have no great anxiety to marry the widow none said the doctor and she isn't a widow yet it was not Milsom who spoke, but the man at the bench, the industrious worker, whose eye was still at the microscope. "'Keep your comments to yourself,' said Van Herden angrily. "'Finish your work and get out.' "'I've finished.' The worker rose slowly, and, loosening the tapes off his mask, pulled it off. "'My name is Beale,' he said calmly. "'I think we've met before.' "'Don't move, Milsom, unless you want to save living expenses. I'm a fairly quick shot when I'm annoyed.' Stanford Beale pushed back the microscope and seated himself on the edge of the bench. "'You addressed me as Bridgers,' he said. "'You will find Mr. Bridgers in a room behind that stack of boxes. The fact is, he surprised me spying, and was all for shooting me up. But I induced him to come into my private office, so to speak.' and the rest was easy. He dopes, doesn't he? He hadn't the strength of a rat. However, that is all beside the point. Dr. Van Herden, what have you to say against my arresting you out of hand on a conspiracy charge? Van Herden smiled contemptuously. There are many things I can say, he said. In the first place, you have no authority to arrest anybody. You're not a police officer, but only an American amateur. "'American, yes, but amateur, no,' said Beale gently. "'As to the authority, why, I guess I can arrest you first and get the authority after.' "'On what charge?' demanded Milsom. "'There is nothing secret about this place except Dr. Van Herden's association with it. A professional man is debarred from mixing in commercial affairs. "'Is it a crime to run a—' he looked at Van Herden. "'A germicide factory,' said Van Herden promptly. "'Suppose I know the character of this laboratory,' said Beale quietly. "'Carry that kind of story to the police, and see what steps they will take,' said Van Herden scornfully. "'My dear Mr. Beale, as I have told you once before, you have been reading too much exciting detective fiction.' "'Very likely,' he said. But, anyhow, the little story that enthralls me just now is called The Green Terror, and I'm looking to you to supply a few of the missing pages, and I think you'll do it. The doctor was lighting a cigarette, and he looked at the other over the flaring match with a gleam of malicious amusement in his eyes. Your romantic fantasies would exasperate me but for your evident sincerity. "'Having stolen my bride, you seem anxious to steal my reputation,' he said mockingly. "'That,' said Beale, slipping off the bench and standing, hands on hips, before the door, "'would take a bit of finding. "'I tell you, Van Herden, that I'm going to call your bluff. "'I shall place this factory in the hands of the police, "'and I'm going to call in the greatest scientists in England, France, and America "'to prove the charge I shall make against you on the strength 
of this. He held up between his forefinger and thumb a crystal tube filled to its seal with something that looked like green sawdust. The world, the skeptical world, shall know the hell you are preparing for them. Stanford Beale's voice trembled with passion, and his face was dark with the thought of a crime so monstrous that even the outrageous treatment of a woman who was more to him than all the world was for the moment obliterated from his mind in the contemplation of the danger which threatened humanity. You say that the police and even the government of this country will dismiss my charge as being too fantastic for belief. You shall have the satisfaction of knowing that you are right. They think that I am mad, but I will convince them. In this tube lies the destruction of all your fondest dreams, Van Herden. To realize those dreams you have murdered two men. For these you killed John Millenborn and the man Prado. But you shall not— Bang! The explosion roared thunderously in the confined space of the vault. Beale felt the wind of the bullet and turned, pistol upraised. End of chapter 25 Recorded by Kirsten Weber Chapter 26 of The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Kirsten Weber The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace Chapter 26 THE SECRET OF THE GREEN RUST A disheveled figure stood by the boxes, revolver in hand. It was Bridgers, the man he had left strapped and bound in the ambulance room, and Beale cursed the folly which had induced him to leave the revolver behind. "'I'll fix you, you brute!' screamed Bridgers. "'Get away from him! Ah!' Beale's hand flew up. A pencil of flame quivered, and again the vault trembled to the deafening report. But Bridgers had dropped to cover. Again he shot, this time with unexpected effect. The bullet struck the fuse-box on the opposite wall, and all the lights went out. Beale was still holding the glass tube, and this Milsom had seen. Quick as thought, he hurled himself upon the detective— his big, powerful hands gripped the other's wrist and wrenched it round. Beale set his teeth and maneuvered for a lock grip, but he was badly placed, pressed as he was against the edge of the bench. He felt Van Herden's fingers clawing at his hand, and the tube was torn away. Then somebody pulled the revolver from the other hand, and there was a scamper of feet. He groped his way through the blackness and ran into the pile of boxes. A bullet whizzed past him from the half-crazy bridgers, but that was a risk he had to take. He heard the squeak of an opening door and stumbled blindly in its direction. Presently he found it. He had to watch the other men go out and discovered the steps. Two minutes later he was in the street. There was no sign of either of the two men. He found a policeman after he had walked a half a mile, but that intelligent officer could not leave his beat, and advised him to go to the police station. It was an excellent suggestion, for although the sergeant on duty was wholly unresponsive, there was a telephone, and at the end of the telephone, in his little haymarket flat, a superintendent, McNorton, the mention of whose very name galvanized the police officer to activity. "'I have found the factory I've been looking for, McNorton,' said Beale. "'I'll explain the whole thing to you in the morning. What I want now is a search made of the premises.' "'We can't do that without a magistrate's warrant,' said McNorton's voice. "'But what we can do is guard the premises until the warrant is obtained.' "'Ask the station sergeant to speak on the phone. "'By the way, how is Miss Cresswell? "'Better, I hope?' "'Much better,' said the young man shortly. "'It was unbelievable that she could ever fill his heart "'with the ache which came at the mention of her name. "'He made way for the station sergeant, "'and later accompanied four men back to the laboratory. 
they found all the doors closed. Beale scaled the wall, but failed to find a way in. He rejoined the sergeant on the other side of the wall. "'What is the name of this street?' he asked. "'Playbury Street, sir. This used to be Henderson's wine vaults in my younger days.' Beale jotted down the address, and, finding a taxi, drove back to the police station, wearied and sick at heart. He arrived in time to be a witness to a curious scene. In the centre of the charge-room, and facing the sergeant's desk, was a man of middle age, shabbily dressed, but bearing the indefinable air of one who had seen better days. The grey hair was carefully brushed from the familiar face, and gave him that venerable appearance which pale eyes and a pair of thin, straight lips, curled now in an amused smile, did their best to discount. By his side stood his captor, a station detective, a bored and apathetic man. "'It seems,' the prisoner was saying, as Stanford Beale came noiselessly into the room, "'it seems that under this detestable system of police espionage a fellow may not even take a walk in the cool of the morning.' His voice was that of an educated man. His drawling address spoke of his confidence." "'Now look here, Parson,' said the station sergeant, in that friendly tone which the police adopt when dealing with their pet criminals. "'You know as well as I do that, under the Prevention of Crimes Act, you, an old lag, are liable to be arrested if you are seen in any suspicious circumstances. You oughtn't to be wandering about the streets in the middle of the night, and if you do, why, you mustn't kick because you're pinched.' "'Anything found on him, Smith?' "'No, Sergeant. He was just mouching round, so I pulled him in. "'Where are you living now, Parson?' The man, with extravagant care, searched his pockets. "'I have inadvertently left my card-case with my coiner's outfit,' he said gravely. "'But a wire addressed to the Doss House, Mine Street, Paddington, will find me.' but I don't think I should try. At this moment I enjoy the protection of the law. In four days' time I shall be on the ocean. Why, Mr. Beale? Mr. Beale smiled. Hello, Parson. I thought you had sailed to-day. The first-class berths are all taken, and I will not travel to Australia with the common herd. He turned to the astonished sergeant. "'Can I go? Mr. Beale will vouch for me.' As he left the charge-room, he beckoned the detective, and when they were together in the street, Beale found all the parson's flippancy had departed. "'I'm sorry I got you into that scrape,' he said seriously. "'I ought to have been unfrocked, but I was sentenced for my first crime under an assumed name.' I was not attached to any church at the time, and my identity has never been discovered. Mr. Beale, he went on with a quizzical smile, I have yet to commit my ideal crime, the murder of a bishop who allows a curate to marry a wife on sixty pounds a year. His face darkened, and Beale found himself wondering at the contents of the tragic years behind the man. Where was the wife? But my private grievances against the world will not interest you, Parson Homo resumed. I only called you out to, well, to ask your pardon. It was my own fault, Homo, said Beale quietly, and held out his hand. Good luck. There may be a life for you in the new land. He stood till the figure passed out of sight, then turned wearily toward his own rooms. He went to his room and lay down on his bed, fully dressed. He was aroused from a troubled sleep by the jangle of the phone. It was McNorton. "'Come down to Scotland House and see the assistant commissioner,' he said. "'He is very anxious to hear more about this factory. He tells me that you have already given him an outline of the plot.' "'Yes, I'll give you details. I'll be with you in half an hour.' 
He had a bath, and changed his clothes, and breakfastless, for the woman who waited on him, and kept his flat, and who evidently thought his absence was likely to be a long one, had not arrived. He drove to the grim grey building on the Thames Embankment. Assistant Commissioner O'Donnell, a white-haired police veteran, was waiting for him, and McNorton was in the office. "'You look fagged,' said the Commissioner. "'Take that chair. And you look hungry, too. Have you breakfasted?' Beale shook his head with a smile. "'Get him something, McNorton. Ring that bell. Don't protest, my good fellow. I've had exactly the same kind of night as you've had, and I know that it's grub that counts more than sleep.' He gave an order to an attendant, and not until twenty minutes later, when Beale had finished a surprisingly good meal in the superintendent's room, did the commissioner allow the story to be told. "'Now I'm ready,' he said. "'I'll begin at the beginning,' said Stanford Beale. "'I was a member of the United States Secret Service until after the war, when, at the request of Mr. Kitson, who is known to you, I came to Europe to devote all my time to watching Miss Cresswell and Dr. Van Herden. All that you know. One day, when searching the doctor's rooms in his absence, my object being to discover some evidence in relation to the Millenborn murder, I found this. He took a newspaper cutting from his pocket-book and laid it on the table. It is from El Imparcial, a Spanish newspaper, and I will translate it for you. Thanks to the discretion and eminent genius of Dr. Alfonso Romanos, the chief medical officer at Vigo, the farmers of the district have been spared a catastrophe much lamentable. I am translating literally. On Monday last, Señor Don Marín Fernández of La Linea, discovered one of his fields of corn had died in the night, and was already in a condition of rot. In alarm he notified the chief of medicines at Vigo, and Dr. Alfonso Romanos, with that zeal and alacrity which has marked his acts, was quick on the spot, accompanied by a foreign scientist. Happily, the learned and gentle doctor is a bacteriologist superb, an examination of the dead corn, which already emitted unpleasant odors, revealed the presence of a new disease, the verde orin, green rust. By his orders the field was burnt. Fortunately, the area was small and dissociated from the other fields of Señor Fernadé by wide zanzas. With the exception of two small pieces of the infected corn, carried away by Dr. Romanos and the foreign medical cavalier, the pest was incinerated. The foreign medical cavalier, said Beale, was Dr. Van Herden. The date was 1915, when the doctor was taking his summer holiday, and I have had no difficulty in tracing him. I sent one of my men to Vigo to interview Dr. Romanos, who remembers the circumstances perfectly. He himself had thought it wisest to destroy the germ after carefully noting their characteristics, and he expressed the anxious hope that his whilom friend, Van Herden, had done the same. Van Herden, of course, did nothing of the sort. He has been assiduously cultivating the germs in his laboratory. So far as I can ascertain from Professor Heiler, an old German who was in Van Herden's service, and who seems a fairly honest man. The doctor nearly lost the culture, and it was only by sending out small quantities to various seedy scientists, and getting them to experiment in the cultivation of the germ under various conditions, that he found the medium in which they best flourish. It is, I believe, fermented rye flour, but I am not quite sure." "'To what purpose do you suggest Van Herden will put his cultivations?' asked the Commissioner. "'I am coming to that. In the course of my inquiries and searchings, I found that he was collecting very accurate data concerning the great wheat-fields of the world. 
from the particulars he was preparing, I formed the idea that he intended, and intends, sending an army of agents all over the world who, at a given signal, will release the germs in the growing wheat. But surely a few germs sprinkled on a great wheat field, such as you find in America, would do no more than local damage. Beale shook his head. Mr. O'Donnell, he said soberly, if I broke a tube of that stuff in the corner of a ten-thousand-acre field, the whole field would be rotten in twenty-four hours. It spreads from stock to stock with a rapidity that is amazing. One germ multiplies itself in a living cornfield a billion times in twelve hours. It would not only be possible, but certain, that twenty of Van Herden's agents in America could destroy the harvests of the United States in a week. But why should he do this? He is a German, you say, and Germans do not engage in frightfulness unless they see a dividend at the end of it. There is a dividend, a dividend of millions at the end of it, said Beale, graver. That much I know. I cannot tell you any more yet, but I can say this that up till yesterday Van Herden was carrying on the work without the aid of his government. That is no longer the case. There is now a syndicate in existence to finance him, and the principal shareholder is the German government. He has already spent thousands, money he has borrowed and money he has stolen. As a sideline, and surely to secure her money, he carried off John Millenborn's heiress with the object of forcing her into marriage. The commissioner chewed the end of his cigar. This is a state matter, and one on which I must consult the home office. You tell me that the foreign office believe your story. Of course I do, too, he added quickly, though it sounds wildly improbable. Wait here. He took up his hat and went out. "'It is going to be a difficult business to convict Van Herden,' said the superintendent when his chief had gone. "'You see, in the English courts motive must be proved to convict before a jury, and there seems no motive except revenge. A jury would take a lot of convincing that a man spent thousands of pounds to avenge a wrong done to his country.' Beale had no answer to this. At the back of his mind he had a dim idea of the sheer money value of the scheme, but he needed other evidence than he possessed. The commissioner returned soon thereafter. "'I have been on the phone to the under-secretary, and we will take action against Van Herden on the evidence the factory offers. I'll put you in charge of the case, McNorton. You have the search warrant already? Good.' He shook hands with Beale. "'You will make a European name over this, Mr. Beale,' he said. "'I hope Europe will have nothing more to talk about,' said Beale. They passed back to McNorton's office. "'I'll come right along,' said the superintendent. He was taking his hat from a peg when he saw a closed envelope lying on his desk. "'From the local police station,' he said. "'How long has this been here?' His clerk shook his head. I can't tell you, sir. It has been there since I came in. Hmm. I must have overlooked it. Perhaps it is news from your factory. He tore it open, scanned the contents, and swore. There goes your evidence, Beale, he said. What is it? asked Beale quickly. The factory was burned to the ground in the early hours of the morning, he said. The fire started in the old wine vault, and the whole building has collapsed. The detective stared out of the window. Can we arrest Van Herden on the evidence of Professor Hyler? For answer, McNorton handed him the letter. It ran, From Inspector in Charge, South Paddington, to Superintendent McNorton. Factory in Playbury Street, under P.O., Police Observation completely destroyed by fire, which broke out in basement at 5.20 this morning. One body found, believed to be a man named 
Hyler. End of chapter 26. Recorded by Kirsten Weber. Chapter 27 of The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Kirsten Weber. The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace. Chapter 27 A Scheme to Starve the World. There is a menace about Monday morning which few have escaped. It is a menace which, in one guise or another, clouds hundreds of millions of pillows, gives to the golden sunlight which filters through a billion panes the very hues and character of jaundice. It is the menace of factory and workshop, harsh prisons which shut men and women from the green fields and the pleasant byways, the menace of new responsibilities to be faced and new difficulties to be overcome. Into the space of Monday morning drain the dregs of last week's commitments to gather into stagnant pools upon the desks and benches of toiling and scheming humanity. It is the end of the holiday, the foot of the new hill, whose crest is Saturday night, and whose most pleasant outlook is the Sunday to come. Men go to their work reluctant and resentful, and reach out for the support which the lunch hour brings. One o'clock in London is about six o'clock in Chicago. Therefore the significance of shoals and cablegrams, which lay on the desks of certain brokers, was not wholly apparent until late in the evening, and was not thoroughly understood until late on Tuesday morning when to other and greater shoals of cables came the terse price-lists from the Board of Trade in Chicago, and, on top of all, the wireless press accounts for the sensational jump in wheat. "'Wheat soaring,' said one headline. "'Frantic scenes in the pit,' said another. "'Wheat reaches famine price,' blared a third. Beale, passing through to Whitehall, heard the shrill call of the newsboys, and caught the word wheat. He snatched a paper from the hands of a boy, and read, Every corn market in the northern hemisphere was in a condition of chaos. Prices were jumping to a figure beyond any which the most stringent days of war had produced. He slipped into a telephone booth, gave a treasury number, and McNorton answered. "'Have you seen the papers?' he asked. "'No, but I've heard. You mean about the wheat boom? Yes, the game has started. Where are you? Wait for me. I'll join you.' Three minutes later McNorton appeared from the Whitehall end of Scotland Yard. Beale hailed a cab, and they drove to the hotel together. "'Warrants have been issued for Van Herden and Milsom and the girl Glaum,' he said. "'I expect we shall find the nest empty, but I have sent men to all the railway stations. "'Do you think we've moved too late?' "'Everything depends on the system that Van Herden has adopted,' replied Beale. "'He is the sort of man who would keep everything in his own hands. "'If he has done that, and we catch him, we may prevent a world catastrophe.' At the hotel they found Kitson waiting in the vestibule. "'Well,' he asked, "'I gather that you've lost Van Herden, but if the newspapers mean anything, his hand is down on the table. Everybody is crazy here,' he said, as he led the way to the elevator. "'I've just been speaking to the under-minister for agriculture. All Europe is scared. Now what is the story?' he asked, when they were in his room." He listened attentively, and did not interrupt, until Stanford Beale had finished. "'That's big enough,' he said. "'I owe you an apology. Much as I was interested in Miss Cresswell, I realized that her fate was as nothing beside the greater issue.' "'What does it mean?' asked McNorton. "'The wheat panic? God knows. It may mean bread at a guinea a pound. It is too early to judge.' The door was opened unceremoniously, and a man strode in. McNorton was the first to recognize the intruder, and rose to his feet. 
"'I'm sorry to interrupt you,' said Lord Sevington. It was the Foreign Secretary of Great Britain himself. "'Well, Beale, the fantastic story you told me seems in a fair way to being realized.' "'This is Mr. Kitson,' introduced Stanford, and the grey-haired statesman bowed. "'I sent for you, but decided I couldn't wait, so I came myself. Ah, McNorton, what are the chances of catching Van Herden? "'No man has ever escaped from this country once his identity was established,' said the police chief, hopefully. "'If we had taken Beale's advice, we should have the gentleman under lock and key,' said the foreign minister, shaking his head. "'You probably know that Mr. Beale has been in communication with the Foreign Office for some time,' he said, addressing Kitson. "'I did not know,' admitted the lawyer. "'We thought it was one of those brilliant stories which the American newspaper reporters love,' smiled the minister. "'I don't quite get the commercial end of it,' said Kitson. "'How does Van Herden benefit by destroying the crops of the world?' "'He doesn't benefit, because the crops won't be destroyed,' said the minister. "'The South Russian crops are all right, the German crops are intact, but are practically all mortgaged to the German government.' "'The government?' "'This morning the German government have made two announcements. The first is the commandeering of all the standing crops, and at the same time the taking over of all options on the sale of wheat.' Great granaries are being established all over Germany. The old Zeppelin sheds. Great heavens! cried Kitson, and stared at Stanford Beale. That was the reason they took over the sheds. A pretty good reason, too, said Beale. Storage is everything in a crisis like this. What is the second announcement, sir? They prohibit the export of grain, said Lord Sevington. The whole of Germany is to be rationed for a year, bread is to be supplied by the government free of all cost to the people, in this way Germany handles the surpluses for us to buy. What will she charge? What she wishes. If Van Herden's scheme goes through, if throughout the world the crops are destroyed, and only that which lies under Germany's hand is spared, what must we pay? Every penny we have taken from Germany, every cent of her war cost, must be returned to her in exchange for wheat. Impossible! Why impossible? There is no limit to the price of rarities. What is rarer than gold is more costly than gold. You, who are in the room, are the only people in the world who know the secret of the green rust, and I can speak frankly to you. I tell you that we must either buy from Germany or make war on Germany, and the latter course is impossible, and if it were possible, would give us no certainty of relief. We shall have to pay. Britain, France, America, Italy. We shall have to pay. We shall pay in gold. We may have to pay in battleships and materiel. Our stocks of corn have been allowed to fall, and today— we have less than a month's supply in England. Every producing country in the world will stop exporting instantly, and they, too, with the harvest nearly due, will be near the end of their stocks. Now tell me, Mr. Beale, in your judgment, is it possible to save the crops by local action? Beale shook his head. I doubt it, he said. It would mean the mobilization of millions of men, the surrounding of all corn tracts, and even then I doubt if your protection would be efficacious. You could send the stuff into the fields by a hundred methods. The only thing to do is to catch Van Herden and stifle the scheme at its fountainhead. The chief of foreign ministry strode up and down the room, his hands thrust into his pockets, his head upon his breast. It means our holding out for twelve months, he said. Can we do it? "'It means more than that, sir,' said Beale quietly. Lord Sevington stopped and faced him. "'More than that? What do you mean?' "'It may mean a cornless world for a generation,' said Beale. "'I have consulted the best authorities, and they agree that the soil will be infected for ten years.' The four men looked at one another helplessly. "'Why,' said Sevington in awe, the whole social and industrial fabric of the world would crumble into dust. 
America would be ruined for a hundred years. There would be deaths by the million. It means the very end of civilization. Beale glanced from one to the other of the little group. Sevington, with his hard old face set in harsh lines, a stony sphinx of a man showing no other sign of his emotion than a mop of ruffled hair. Kitson, an old man, and almost as hard of feature, yet of the two more human, stood with pursed lip, his eyes fixed on the floor, as if he were studying the geometrical pattern of the parquet for future reference. McNorton, big, red-faced, and expressionless, save that his mouth drooped and that his arms were tightly folded as if he were hugging himself in a sheer ecstasy of pain from the street outside came the roar and rumble of london's traffic the dull murmur of countless voices and the shrill high-pitched whine of a newsboy men and women were buying newspapers and seeing no more in the scare headlines than a newspaper sensation Tomorrow they might read further, and grow a little uncomfortable, but for the moment they were only mildly interested, and the majority would turn to the back page for the list of arrivals at Lingfield. "'It is unbelievable,' said Kitson. "'I have exactly the same feeling I had on August 1, 1914, that sensation of unreality.' His voice seemed to arouse the foreign minister from the meditation into which he had fallen, and he started. Beale, he said, you have unlimited authority to act. Mr. McNorton, you will go back to Scotland Yard, and ask the chief commissioner to attend at the office of the Privy Seal. Mr. Beale will keep in touch with me all the time. Without any formal leave-taking, he made his exit followed by superintendent mcnorton that's a badly rattled man said kitson shrewdly the government may fall on this news what will you do get van herden said the other it is the job of your life said kitson quietly and beale knew within a quarter of an hour that the lawyer did not exaggerate van herden had disappeared with dramatic suddenness Detectives who visited his flat discovered that his personal belongings had been removed in the early hours of the morning. He had left with two trunks, which were afterwards found in a cloak-room of a London railway terminus, and a companion who was identified as Milsom. Whether the car had gone east or north, south or west, nobody knew. In the early editions of the evening newspapers, side by side with the account of the panic scenes on the change, was the notice, The Air Ministry announced the suspension of Order 63 of Transmarine Flight Regulations. No aeroplane will be allowed to cross the coastline by day or night without first descending at a coast control station. Aerial patrols have orders to force down any machine which does not obey the descend signal. The signal is now displayed at all coast stations. Every railway station in England, every port of embarkation, were watched by the police. The one photograph of Van Herden in existence, thousands of copies of an excellent snapshot taken by one of Beale's assistants, were distributed by aeroplane to every district centre. At two o'clock, Hilda Glaum was arrested and conveyed to Bow Street. She showed neither surprise nor resentment, and offered no information as to Van Herden's whereabouts. Throughout the afternoon there were the usual crops of false arrest and detention of perfectly innocent people, and at five o'clock it was announced that all telegraphic communication with the continent and with the western hemisphere was suspended until further notice. Beale came back from Barking, whither he had gone to interview a choleric commercial traveller who bore some facial resemblance to Van Herden, and had been arrested in consequence, and discovered that something like a council of war was being held in Kitson's private room. McNorton and two of his assistants were present. There was an under-secretary from the Foreign Office, a great scientist whose services had been called upon, 
and a man whom he recognized as a member of the Committee of the Corn Exchange. He shook his head in answer to McNorton's inquiring glance, and would have taken his seat at the table, but Kitson, who had risen on his entrance, beckoned him to the window. "'We can do without you for a while, Beale,' he said, lowering his voice. "'There's somebody there,' he jerked his head toward a door which led to another room of his suite, "'who requires an explanation, and I think your time will be so fully occupied in the next few days that you had better seize this opportunity whilst you have it.' "'Miss Cresswell,' said Beale, in despair. The old man nodded slowly. "'What does she know?' "'That is for you to discover,' said Kitson gently, and pushed him toward the door. With a quaking heart he turned the knob and stepped guiltily into the presence of the girl who, in the eyes of the law, was his wife. End of chapter 27 Recorded by Kirsten Weber Chapter Twenty Eight of The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Kirsten Weber. The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace. Chapter Twenty Eight The Coming of Dr. Milsom. She rose to meet him, and he stood spellbound, still holding the handle of the door. It seemed that she had taken on new qualities a new and an ethereal grace. At the very thought even of his technical possession of this smiling girl who came forward to greet him, his heart thumped so loudly that he felt she must hear it. She was pale, and there were dark shadows under her eyes, but the hand that gripped his was firm and warm and living. "'I have to thank you for much, Mr. Beale,' she said, Mr. Kitson has told me that I owe my rescue to you. Did he? He answered awkwardly, and wondered what else Kitson had told her. I am trying to be very sensible, and I want you to help me, because you are the most sensible man I know. She went back to the lounge chair where she had been sitting, and pointed to another. It was horribly melodramatic, wasn't it? But I suppose the life of a detective is full of melodrama. "'Oh, brimming over,' he said. "'If you keep very quiet, I will give you a resume of my most interesting cases,' he said, making a pathetic attempt to be flippant, and the girl detected something of his insincerity. "'You have had a trying day,' she said, with quick sympathy. "'Have you rested, Dr. Van Herden?' He shook his head. "'I am glad,' she said. "'Glad?' she nodded. Before he is arrested, she spoke with some hesitation, I want one little matter cleared up. I asked Mr. Kitson, but he put me off and said you would tell me everything. What is it? he asked steadily. She got up and went to her bag, which stood upon a side table, opened it, and took out something which she laid on the palm of her hand. She came back with hand extended, and Beale looked at the glittering object on her palm, and was speechless. "'Do you see that?' she asked. He nodded, having no words for the moment, for that was a thin gold ring. "'It is a wedding ring,' she said, "'and I found it on my finger when I recovered.' "'Oh,' said Beale blankly. "'Was I married?' she asked. He made two or three ineffectual attempts to speak, and ended by nodding. "'I feared so,' she said quietly. "'You see, I recollect nothing of what happened. The last thing I remembered was Dr. Van Haden sitting beside me and putting something into my arm. It hurt a little, but not very much, and I remember I spoke to him. I think it was about you.' A little colour came to her face. "'Or perhaps he was speaking about you, I am not sure,' she said hurriedly. "'I know that you came into it somehow, and that is all I can recall.' "'Nothing else?' he asked dismally. "'Nothing,' she said. 
Try, try, try to remember, he urged her. He realized he was being a pitiable coward, and that he wanted to shift the responsibility for the revelation upon her. She smiled and shook her head. I am sorry, but I can't remember anything. Now you are going to tell me. He discovered that he was sitting on the edge of the chair, and that he was more nervous than he had ever been in his life. "'So I am going to tell you,' he said in a hollow voice. "'Of course I'll tell you. It is rather difficult, you understand.' She looked at him kindly. "'I know it must be difficult for a man like you to speak of your own achievements, but for once you are going to be immodest.' she laughed. "'Well, you see,' he began, "'I knew Van Herden wanted to marry you. I knew that all along. I guessed he wanted to marry you for your money, because, in the circumstances, there was nothing else he could want to marry you for,' he added. "'I mean,' he corrected himself hastily, "'that money was the most attractive thing to him.' "'That doesn't sound very flattering,' she smiled. "'I know I am being crude, but you will forgive me when you learn what I have to say,' he said huskily. "'Van Herden wanted to marry you, and he married me,' she said, "'and I am going to break that marriage as soon as I possibly can.' "'I know, I hope so,' said Stanford Beale. "'I believe it is difficult, but I will do all I possibly can.' "'Believe me, Miss Cresswell.' "'I am not Miss Cresswell any longer,' she said with a wry little face. "'But please don't call me by my real name.' "'I won't,' he said fervently. "'You knew he wanted to marry me for my money, "'and not for my beauty or my accomplishments,' she said. "'And so you followed me down to Dean's Folly.' "'Yes, yes, but I must explain.' I know it will sound horrible to you, and you may have the lowest opinion of me, but I have got to tell you. He saw the look of alarm gather in her eyes, and plunged into his story. I thought that if you were already married, Van Herden would be satisfied and take no further steps against you. But I wasn't already married, she said, puzzled. Wait, wait, please, he begged. Keep that in mind, that I was satisfied Van Herden wanted you for your money, and that if you were already married, or even if you weren't and he thought you were, I could save you from dangers the extent of which even I do not know. And there was a man named Homo, a crook. He had been a parson, and had all the manner and style of his profession, so I got a special license in my own name. "'You,' she said breathlessly. "'A marriage license? To marry me?' He nodded, and I took Homo with me in my search for you. I knew that I should have a very small margin of time, and I thought if Homo performed the ceremony, and I could confront Van Herden with the accomplished deed, she sprang to her feet with a laugh. "'Oh, I see, I see,' she said. "'Oh, how splendid!' "'And you went through this mock ceremony? Where was I?' "'You were at the window,' he said miserably. "'But how lovely! And you were outside, and your parson with the funny name. But that's delicious. So I wasn't married at all. And this is your ring.' She picked it up with a mocking light in her eyes, and held it out to him. But he shook his head. "'You were married,' he said, in a voice which was hardly audible. "'Married? How? A homo was not a fake. He was a real clergyman, and the marriage was legal.' They looked at one another without speaking. On the girl's part there was nothing but pure amazement. But Stanford Beale read horror, loathing, consternation— and unforgiving wrath, and waited as the criminal waits for his sentence upon her next words. "'So I am really married to you,' she said wonderingly. "'You will never forgive me, I know,' he did not look at her now, 
my own excuse is that I did what I did because I wanted to save you. I might have sailed in with a gun and shot them up. I might have waited my chance and broken into the house. I might have taken a risk and surrounded the place with police. But that would have meant delay. I didn't do the normal things or take the normal view. I couldn't with you. He did not see the momentary tenderness in her eyes, because he was not looking at her, and went on. That's the whole of the grisly story. Mr. Kitson will advise you as to what steps you may take to free yourself. It was a most horrible blunder, and it was all the more tragic because you were the victim, you of all persons in the world. She had put the ring down, and now she took it up again and examined it curiously. It is rather quaint, isn't it? she asked. Oh, very. He thought he heard a sob and looked up. She was laughing, at first silently. Then, as the humor of the thing seized her, her laugh rang clear, and he caught its infection. It's funny, she said at last, wiping her eyes. That is a humorous side to it, poor Mr. Beale. I deserve a little pity, he said ruefully. Why, she asked quickly, have you committed bigamy? Not noticeably so, he answered with a smile. Well, what are you going to do about it? It's rather serious when one thinks of it, seriously. So I am Mrs. Stanford Beale, poor Mr. Beale, and poor Mrs. Beale to be. I do hope, she said, and this time her seriousness was genuine, that I have not upset any of your plans too much. Oh, she sat down, suddenly staring at him. It would be awful, she said in a hushed voice, and I would never forgive myself. Is there, forgive my asking the question, but I suppose, with a flashing smile, as your wife I am entitled to your confidence, is there somebody you are going to marry? I have neither committed bigamy nor do I contemplate it, said Beale, who was gradually recovering his grip of the situation. If you mean am I engaged to somebody, in fact to a girl, he said recklessly, the answer is in the negative. There will be no broken hearts on my side of the family. I have no desire to probe your wounded heart. Don't be flippant, she stopped him sternly. It is a very terrible situation, Mr. Beale, and I hardly dare to think of it. I realize how terrible it is, he said, suddenly bold, and, as I tell you, I will do everything I can to correct my blunder. Does Mr. Kitson know? she asked. He nodded. What did Mr. Kitson say? Surely he gave you some advice? He said, began Stanford, and went red. The girl did not pursue the subject. Come, let us talk about the matter like rational beings, she said cheerfully. I have got over my first inclination to swoon. You must curb your very natural desire to be haughty. I cannot tell you what we can do yet. I don't want to discuss the unpleasant details of a divorce he said, and perhaps you will let me have a few days before we decide on any line of action. Van Herden is still at large, and until he is under lock and key, and this immense danger which threatens the world is removed, I can hardly think straight. Mr. Kitson has told me about Van Herden, she said quietly. Isn't it rather a matter for the English police to deal with? As I have reason to know, she shivered slightly. Dr. Van Herden is a man without any fear or scruple. My scruples hardly keep me awake at night, he said, and I guess I'm not going to let up on Van Herden. I look upon it as my particular job. Isn't it, she hesitated, isn't it rather dangerous? For me, he laughed. No, I don't think so and even if it were, in the most tragic sense of the word dangerous, why, that would save you a great deal of unpleasantness. I think you are being horrid, she said. I am sorry, he responded quickly. 
I was fishing for a little pity, and it was rather cheap and theatrical. No, I do not think there is very much danger. Van Herden is going to keep under cover, and he is after something bigger than my young life. Is Milsom with him? He is the weak link in Van Herden's scheme, Beale said. Somehow Van Herden doesn't strike me as a good team leader, and what little I have seen of Milsom leads me to believe that he is hardly the man to follow the doctor's lead blindly. Besides, it is always easier to catch two men than one. He laughed. That is an old detective's axiom, and it works out. She put out her hand. It's a tangled business, isn't it? she said. I mean us. Don't let it add to your other worries. Forget our unfortunate relationship until we can smooth things out. He shook her hand in silence. And now I am coming out to hear all that you clever people suggest, she said. Please don't look alarmed. I have been talking all the afternoon, and have been narrating my sad experience, such as I remember, to the most important people, cabinet ministers and police commissioners and doctors and things. One moment, he said. He took from his pocket a stout book. I was wondering what that was, she laughed. You haven't been buying me reading matter. He nodded, and held the volume so that she could read the title. A Friend in Need by S. Beale. I didn't know you wrote, she said in surprise. I am literary, and even worse, he said flippantly. I see you have a shelf of books here. If you will allow me, I will put it with the others. But mayn't I see it? He shook his head. I just want to tell you all that you have said about Van Herden is true. He is a most dangerous man. He may yet be dangerous to you. I don't want you to touch that little book unless you are in really serious trouble. Will you promise me? She opened her eyes wide. But, Mr. Beale, will you promise me? He said again. Of course I'll promise, but I don't quite understand. You will understand, he said. He opened the door for her, and she passed out ahead of him. Kitson came to meet them. I suppose there is no news, asked Stanford. None, said the other, except high political news. There has been an exchange of notes between the Triple Alliance and the German government. All communication with the Ukraine is cut off, and three ships have been sunk in the Bosphorus so cleverly that our grain ships in the Black Sea are isolated. That's bad, said Beale. He walked to the table. It was littered with maps and charts and printed tabulations. McNorton got up and joined them. I have just had a phone message through from the yard, he said. Carter, my assistant, says that he's certain Van Herden has not left London. Has the girl spoken? Glaum? No, she's as dumb as an oyster. I doubt if you would get her to speak even if you put her through the third degree, and we don't allow that. So I am told, said Beale dryly. There was a knock at the door. Unlock it, somebody, said Kitson. I turned the key. The nearest person was the member of the Corn Exchange Committee, and he clicked back the lock and the door opened to admit a waiter. There's a man here he said, but before he could say more he was pushed aside, and a dusty, disheveled figure stepped into the room and glanced around. My name is Milsom, he said. I have come to give King's evidence. End of chapter 28 Recorded by Kirsten Weber Chapter 29 of The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Kirsten Weber. The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace. Chapter 29. 
The Lost Code "'I'm Milson,' said the man in the doorway again. His clothes were grimed and dusty, his collar limp and soiled. There were two days' growth of red-gray stubble on his big jaw, and he bore himself like a man who was faint from lack of sleep. He walked unsteadily to the table and fell into a chair. "'Where is Van Herden? asked Beale, but Milsom shook his head. "'I left him two hours ago, after a long and unprofitable talk on patriotism,' he said, and laughed shortly. At that time he was making his way back to his house in Southwark. "'Then he is in London, here in London?' Milsom nodded. "'You won't find him.' he said brusquely. I tell you, I've left him after a talk about certain patriotic misgivings on my part. Look! He lifted his right hand, which hitherto he had kept concealed by his side, and Oliva shut her eyes and felt deathly sick. Right index digit and part of the phalanges shot away, said Milsom philosophically. That was my trigger finger, but he shot first. Give me a drink. They brought him a bottle of wine, and he drank it from a long tumbler in two great breathless gulps. You've closed the coast to him, he said. You shut down your wires and cables. You're watching the roads. But he'll get his message through if— Then he hasn't cabled, said Beale eagerly. Milsom, this means liberty for you, liberty and comfort. Tell us the truth, man. Help us hold off this horror that Van Herden is loosing on the world, and there's no reward too great for you. Milsom's eyes narrowed. It wasn't the hope of reward, or hope of pardon, that made me break with Van Herden, he said in his slow way. You'd laugh yourself sick if I told you. It was, it was the knowledge that this country would be down and out that the people who spoke my tongue and thought more or less as i thought should be under the foot of the beast fevered sentimentality you don't believe that i believe it it was oliva who spoke and it appeared that this was the first time that milsom had noticed her presence for his eyes opened wider you oh you believe it do you and he nodded but why is van herden waiting asked McNorton. What is he waiting for? The big man rolled his head helplessly from side to side, and the hard cackle of his laughter was very trying to men whose nerves were raw and on edge. That's the fatal lunacy of it. I think it must be a national characteristic. You saw it in the war again and again, a wonderful plan brought to naught by some piece of over-cleverness on the part of the superman. A wild hope leapt to Beale's heart. Then it has failed, the rust has not answered? But Milsom shook his head wearily. The rust is all that he thinks, and then some, he said. No, it isn't that. It is in the work of organization where the hitch has occurred. You know something of the story. Van Herden has agents in every country in the world. He has spent nearly a hundred thousand pounds in perfecting his working plans, and I'm willing to admit that they are well-nigh perfect. Such slight mistakes as sending men to South Africa and Australia, where the crops are six months later than the European and American harvests, may be forgiven because the German thinks longitudinally and north and south are the two points of the compass which he never bothers his head about. If the Germans had been a seafaring people, they'd have discovered America before Columbus, but they would never have found the North Pole or rounded the Cape in a million years. He paused, and they saw the flicker of a smile in his weary eyes. The whole scheme is under Van Herden's hand. At the word go, Thousands of his agents begin their work of destruction, but the word must come from him. He has so centralized his scheme that if he died suddenly, without that word being uttered, the work of years would come to naught. I guess he is suspicious of everybody. 
including his new government. For the best part of a year he has been arranging and planning, with the assistance of a girl, a compatriot of his, he has reduced all things to order. In every country is a principal agent who possesses a copy of a simple code. At the proper moment, Van Herden would cable a word which meant get busy, or hold off until you hear from me, or abandon scheme for this year and collect cultures. I happen to be word perfect in the meanings of the code words because Van Herden has so often drummed them into me. What are the code words? I'm coming to that, nodded Milsom. Van Herden is the type of scientist that never trusts his memory. You find that kind in all the school. They usually spend their time making the most complete and detailed notes, and their studies are packed with memoranda. Yet he had a wonderful memory for the commonplace things. For example, in the plain English of his three messages, he was word-perfect. He could tell you offhand the names and addresses of all his agents. But when it came to scientific data, his mind was a blank until he consulted his authorities. It seemed that once he made a note, his mind was incapable of retaining the information he'd committed to paper. That, as I say, is a phenomenon which is not infrequently met with amongst men of science. "'And he had committed the code to paper?' asked Kitson. "'I'm coming to that. After the fire at the Paddington Works, Van Herden said the time had come to make a getaway. He was going to the continent. I was to sail for Canada. Before you go,' he said, "'I will give you the code.' but I am afraid that I cannot do that until after ten o'clock. McNorton was scribbling notes in shorthand and carefully circled the hour. We went back to his flat and had breakfast together. It was then about five o'clock. He packed a few things, and I particularly noticed that he looked very carefully at the interior of a little grip which he had brought the previous night from Staines. He was so furtive, carrying the bag to the light of the window, that I supposed he was consulting his code, and I wondered why he should defer giving me the information until ten o'clock. Anyway, I could swear he took something from the bag and slipped it into his pocket. We left the flat soon after, and drove to a railway station, where the baggage was left. Van Herden had given me banknotes for a thousand pounds, in case we should be separated, and I went on to the house in South London. You needn't ask me where it is, because Van Herden is not there. He gulped again at the wine. At eleven o'clock Van Herden came back, resumed Milsom, and if ever a man was panic-stricken, it was he. The long and short of it is that the code was mislaid. Mislaid? Beale was staggered. Here was farce interpolated into tragedy, the most grotesque, the most unbelievable farce. Mislaid, said Milsom. He did not say as much, but I gathered from the few disjointed words he flung at me that the code was not irredeemably lost. In fact, I have reason to believe that he knows where it is. It was after that that Van Herden started in to do some tall cursing of me, my country, my decadent race, and the like. Things have been strained all afternoon. Tonight they reached a climax. He wanted me to help him in a burglary, and burglary is not my forte. "'What did he want to burgle?' asked McNorton, with professional interest. "'Ah, there you have me.' It was the question I asked, and he refused to answer. I was to put myself in his hands, and there was to be some shooting, if, as he thought likely, a caretaker was left on the premises to be entered. I told him flat, we were sitting on Wandsworth Common at the time, that he could leave me out, and that is where we became mutually offensive. He looked at his maimed hand. I dressed it roughly at a chemist's, 
The iodine open dressing isn't beautiful, but it is antiseptic. He shot to kill, too. There's no doubt about that. A very perfect little gentleman. He's in London, said McNorton. That simplifies matters. To my mind it complicates rather than simplifies, said Beale. London is a vast proposition. Can you give us any idea as to the hour the burglary was planned for? Eleven, said Milsom promptly. That is to say, in a little over one hour's time. And you have no idea of the locality? Somewhere in East London we were to have met at Aldgate. I don't understand it, said McNorton. Do you suggest that the code is in the hands of somebody who is not willing to part with it? And now that he no longer needs it for you, is there any reason why he should wait? Every reason, replied Milsom, and Stanford Beale nodded in agreement. It was not only for me he wanted it. He as good as told me that unless he recovered it, he would be unable to communicate with his men. What do you think he'll do? He'll get Bridgers to assist him. Bridgers is a pretty sore man, and the doctor knows just where he can find him. As Oliva listened, an idea slowly dawned in her mind that she might supply a solution to the mystery of the missing code. It was a wildly improbable theory she held, but even so slender a possibility was not to be discarded. She slipped from the group and went back to her room. For the accommodation of his ward, James Kitson had taken the adjoining suite to his own, and had secured a lady's maid from an agency for the girl's service. She passed through the sitting-room to her own bedroom, and found the maid putting the room ready for the night. "'Minnie,' she said, throwing a quick glance about the apartment, "'where did you put the clothes I took off when I came?' "'Here, miss.' The girl opened the wardrobe, and Oliver made a hurried search. "'Did you find anything, a little ticket?' The girl smiled. "'Oh, yes, miss, it was in your stocking.' Oliver laughed. "'I suppose you thought it was rather queer, finding that sort of thing in a girl's stocking?' she asked. But the maid was busily opening the drawers of the dressing-table in search of something. "'Here it is, miss.' She held a small square ticket in her hand, and held it with such disapproving primness that Oliver nearly laughed. "'I found it in your stocking, miss,' she said again. "'Quite right,' said Oliver coolly. "'That's where I put it. I always carry my pawn tickets in my stocking.' The admirable Minnie sniffed. "'I suppose you have never seen such a thing,' smiled Oliver. "'and you hardly knew what it was.' "'The lady's maid turned very red. "'She had unfortunately seen many such certificates of penury, "'but all that was part of her private life, "'and she had been shocked beyond measure "'to be confronted with this too familiar evidence of impecuniosity "'in the home of a lady who represented to her "'an assured income and comfortable pickings.' Oliver went back to her sitting-room and debated the matter. It was a sense of diffidence, the fear of making herself ridiculous, which arrested her. Otherwise she might have flung into the room, declaimed her preposterous theories, and leave these clever men to work out the details. She opened the door, and, with the ticket clenched in her hand, stepped into the room. If they had missed her after she had left— Nobody saw her return. They were sitting in a group around the table, firing questions at the big, unshaven man who had made such a dramatic entrance to the conference, and who, with a long cigar in the corner of his mouth, was answering readily and fluently. But, faced with the tangible workings of criminal investigation, her resolution and her theories shrank to vanishing point. She clasped the ticket in her hand and felt for a pocket, but the dressmaker had not provided her with that useful appendage, so she turned and went softly back to her room, praying that she would not be noticed. She closed the door gently behind her, and turned, 
to meet a well-valeted man in evening dress who was standing in the middle of the room a light overcoat thrown over his arm his silk hat tilted back from his forehead a picture of calm assurance don't move said van herden and don't scream and be good enough to hand over the pawn ticket you are holding in your hand silently she obeyed and as she handed the little pasteboard across the table which separated them she looked past him to the bookshelf behind his head and particularly to a new volume which bore the name of stanford beale end of chapter twenty nine recorded by kirsten weber Chapter Thirty of *The Green Rust* by Edgar Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Kirsten Weber. *The Green Rust* by Edgar Wallace. Chapter Thirty. The Watch. Thanks," said Van Herden, pocketing the ticket. "It is of no use to me now, for I cannot wait." i gather that you have not disclosed the fact that this ticket is in your possession i don't know how you gather that she said lower your voice he hissed menacingly i gather as much because beale knew the ticket would not be in my possession now if he only knew if he only had a hint of its existence i fear my scheme would fail as it is i will succeed and now he said with a smile time is short and your preparations must be of the briefest i will save you the trouble of asking questions by telling you that i am going to take you along with me i certainly cannot afford to leave you get your coat with a shrug she walked past him to the bedroom and he followed are we going far she asked there was no tremor in her voice, and she felt remarkably self-possessed. "'That you will discover,' said he. "'I am not asking out of idle curiosity, but I want to know whether I ought to take a bag.' "'Perhaps it would be better,' he said. She carried the little attaché case back to the sitting-room. "'You have no objection to my taking a little light reading matter?' she asked contemptuously. I am afraid you are not a very entertaining companion, Dr. Van Herden. Excellent girl, said Van Herden cheerfully. Take anything you like. She slipped a book from the shelf and nearly betrayed herself by an involuntary explanation as she felt its weight. You are not very original in your methods, she said. This is the second time you have spirited me off. The jails of England, as your new-found friend Milsom will tell you, are filled with criminals who departed from the beaten tracks, said Van Herden. Walk out into the corridor and turn to the right. I will be close behind you. A little way along you will discover a narrow passage which leads to the service staircase. Go down that. I am sure you believe me when I say that I will kill you if you attempt to make any signal or scream or appeal for help. She did not answer. It was because of this knowledge and this fear, which was part of her youthful equipment, for violent death is a very terrible prospect to the young and the healthy, that she obeyed him at all. They walked down the stone stairs, through an untidy, low-roofed lobby, redolent of cooking food, into the street, without challenge and without attracting undue notice. Van Herden's car was waiting at the end of the street, and she thought she recognized the chauffeur as Bridger's. "'Once more we ride together,' said Van Herden gaily. "'And what will be the end of this adventure for you?' depends entirely upon your loyalty. "'What are you opening your bag for?' he asked, peering in the darkness. "'I am looking for a handkerchief,' said Oliver. "'I am afraid I am going to cry.' He settled himself back in the corner of the car with a sigh of resignation, accepting her explanation. 
Sarcasm was wholly wasted on Van Herden. "'Well, gentlemen,' said Milsom, "'I don't think there is anything more I can tell you. What are you going to do with me?' "'I'll take the responsibility of not executing the warrant,' said McNorton. "'You will accompany one of my men to his home to-night, and you will be under police supervision.' "'That's no new experience,' said Milsom. "'There is only one piece of advice I want to give you.' "'And that is?' asked Beale. "'Don't underrate Van Herden. You have no conception of his nerve.' "'There isn't a man of us here,' he said, "'whose insurance rate wouldn't go up to ninety per cent "'if Van Herden decided to get him. "'I don't profess that I can help you to explain his strange conduct today. "'I can only outline the psychology of it. "'But how and where he has hidden his code, "'and what circumstances prevent its recovery, "'is known only to Van Herden.' "'He nodded to the little group and, accompanied by McNorton, left the room. "'There goes a pretty bad man,' said Kitson, "'or I am no judge of character. "'He's an old lag, isn't he?' Beale nodded. "'Murder,' he said laconically. "'He lived after his time. "'He should have been a contemporary of the Borgias.' "'A poisoner,' shuddered one of the under-secretaries, "'I remember the case. He killed his nephew, and defended himself on the plea that the youth was a degenerate, as he undoubtedly was. "'He might have got that defence passed in America or France,' said Beale. "'But, unfortunately, there was a business end to the matter. He was the sole heir of his nephew's considerable fortune, and a jury from the Society of Eugenics would have convicted him on that.' He looked at his watch, and turned his eyes to Kitson. "'I presume Miss Cresswell is bored, and has retired for the night,' he said. "'I'll find out in a moment,' said Kitson. "'Did you speak to her?' Beale nodded, and his eyes twinkled. "'Did you make any progress?' "'I broke the sad news to her, if that's what you mean.' "'You told her she was married to you? Good heavens! What did she say?' "'Well, she didn't faint. I don't think she's the fainting kind. She is cursed with a sense of humour, and refused even to take the tragic view.' "'That's bad,' said Kitson, shaking his head. "'A sense of humour is out of place in a divorce court, and that is where your little romance is going to end, my friend.' "'I am not so sure,' said Beale calmly, and the other stared at him. "'You have promised me,' he began, with a note of acerbity in his voice. "'And you have advised me,' said Beale. Kitson choked down something which he was going to say, but which he evidently thought was better left unsaid. "'Wait,' he commanded. "'I will find out whether Miss Cresswell,' he emphasized the words, "'has gone to bed.' He passed through the door to Oliver's sitting-room and was gone for a few minutes. When he came back, Beale saw his troubled face and ran forward to meet him. "'She's not there,' said Kitson. "'Not in her room?' "'Neither in the sitting-room nor the bedroom. I have rung for her maid. Oh, here you are.' Prim Minnie came through the bedroom door. "'Where is your mistress?' "'I thought she was with you, sir.' "'What is this?' said Beale. He stooped and picked up a white kid glove. "'She surely hasn't gone out,' he said in consternation. "'That's not a lady's glove, sir,' said the girl. "'That is a gentleman's.' It was a new glove, and turning it over he saw stamped inside the words Glebla Rotterdam. "'Has anybody been here?' he asked. "'Not to my knowledge, sir.' The young lady told me she did not want me any more to-night. The girl hesitated. It seemed a veritable betrayal of her mistress to declose such a sordid matter as the search for a pawn ticket. Beale noticed her hesitation. "'You must tell me everything, and tell me quickly,' he said. "'Well, sir,' said the maid, 
the lady came in to look for something she brought with her when she came here i remember cried kitson she told me she had brought away something very curious from van herden's house and made me guess what it was something interrupted our talk what was it well sir said the maid resigned i won't tell you a lie sir it was a pawn ticket a pawn ticket cried kitson and beale in unison are you sure asked the latter absolutely sure sir but she couldn't have brought a pawn ticket from van herden's house what was it for i beg your pardon sir what was on the pawn ticket said kitson impatiently what article had been pledged again the girl hesitated to betray her mistress was unpleasant to betray herself as she would if she confessed that she had most carefully and thoroughly read the voucher was unthinkable you know what was on it said beale in his best third-degree manner now don't keep us waiting what was it a watch sir how much was it pledged for ten shillings sir do you remember the name in a foreign name sir van horden van herden said beale quickly and at what pawnbroker's well sir said the girl making a fight for her reputation i only glanced at the tickets and i only noticed yes you did interrupted beale sharply you read every line of it where was it rosenblum brothers of commercial road blurted the girl any number i didn't see the number you will find them in the telephone book said kitson what does it mean but beale was halfway to kitson's sitting-room arriving there in time to meet mcnorton who had handed over his charge to his subordinate i've found it cried beale found what asked kitson the code where how asked mcnorton unless i am altogether wrong the code is contained either engraved on the case or written on a slip of paper enclosed within the case of a watch can't you see it all plainly now van herden neither trusted his memory nor his subordinates he had his simple code written as we shall find upon thin paper enclosed in the case of a hunter watch and this he pledged a pawnbroker's is the safest of safe deposits searching for clues suppose the police had detected his preparations the pledge ticket might have been easily overlooked kitson was looking at him with an expression of amazed indignation here was a man who had lost his wife and kitson believed that this young detective loved the girl as few women are loved but in the passion of the chase in the production of a new problem he was absorbed to the exclusion of all other considerations in the greater game yet he did feel an injustice if he only knew for the thought of oliver's new peril ran through all his speculations his rapid deductions his lightning plans miss cresswell found the ticket and probably extracted it as a curiosity these things are kept in little envelopes aren't they mcnorton the police chief nodded that was it then she took it out and left the envelope behind and van herden did not discover his loss until he went to find the voucher to give milsom the code don't you remember in the first place he said he couldn't give him the code until after ten o'clock which is probably the hour the pawnbroker's opens for business mcnorton nodded again then do you remember that milsom said that the code was not irredeemably lost and that van herden knew where it was in default of finding the ticket he decided to burgle the pawnbrokers and that burglary is going through to-night but he could have obtained a duplicate of the ticket said mcnorton how asked beale quickly by going before a magistrate and swearing an affidavit in his own name said beale you see he couldn't do that it would mean walking into the lion's den no burglary was his only chance 
"'But what of Oliver?' said Kitson impatiently. "'I tell you, Beale, I am not big enough or stoical enough to think outside of that girl's safety.' Beale swung round at him. "'You don't think I've forgotten that, do you?' he said in a low voice. "'You don't think that has been out of my mind?' His face was tense and drawn. "'I think, I believe, that Oliver is safe,' he said quietly. "'I believe that Oliver, and not any of us here, will deliver Van Heerden to justice.' "'Are you mad?' asked Kitson, in astonishment. "'I am very sane. Come here.' He gripped the old lawyer by the arm, and led him back to the girl's room. "'Look,' he said, and pointed. "'What do you mean, the bookshelf?' Beale nodded. "'Half an hour ago I gave Oliver a book,' he said. "'That book is no longer there.' "'But in the name of heaven how can a book save her?' demanded the exasperated Kitson. Stanford Beale did not answer. "'Yes, yes, she's safe. I know she's safe,' he said. "'If Oliver is the girl I think she is, then I see Van Herden's finish.' End of chapter 30 Recorded by Kirsten Weber Chapter 31 of The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Kirsten Weber The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace Chapter 31 A Corn Chandler's Bill the church bells were chiming eleven o'clock when a car drew up before a gloomy corner shop bearing the dingy sign of the pawnbroker's calling and beale and mcnorton alighted it was a main street and was almost deserted beale looked up at the windows they were dark he knocked at the side entrance of the shop and presently the two men were joined by a policeman "'Nobody lives here, sir,' explained the officer, when McNorton had made himself known. "'Old Rosenblum runs the business and lives at Highgate.' He flashed his lamp upon the door and tried it, but it did not yield. A night-farer, who had been in the shade on the opposite side of the street, came across and volunteered information. He had seen another car drive up, and a gentleman had alighted. He had opened the door with a key and gone in. There was nothing suspicious about him. He was quite a gentleman and was in evening dress. The constable thought it was one of the partners of Rosenblum in convivial and resplendent garb. He had been in the house ten minutes, then had come out again, locking the door behind him, and had driven off just before Beale's car had arrived. It was not until half an hour later that an agitated little man brought by the police from Highgate admitted the two men. There was no need to make a long search. The moment the light was switched on in the shop, Beale made his discovery. On the broad counter lay a sheet of paper and a little heap of silver coins. He swept the money aside and read, for the redemption of one silver hunter, ten shillings, sixpence. It was signed in the characteristic handwriting that Beale knew so well, Van Herden, M.D. The two men looked at one another. "'What do you make of that?' asked McNorton. Beale carried the paper to the light and examined it, and McNorton went on, "'He's a pretty cool fellow.' I suppose he had the money and the message all ready for our benefit. Beale shook his head. On the contrary, he said, this was done on the spur of the moment, a piece of bravado which occurred to him when he had the watch. Look at this paper. You can imagine him searching his pocket for a piece of waste paper and taking the first that came to his hand. It is written in ink with the pawnbroker's own pen. The inkwell is open, he lifted up the pen. The nib is still wet, he said. McNorton took the paper from his hands. It was a bill from a corn chandler's at Horsham, the type of bill that was sent in days of war economy 
which folded over and constituted its own envelope. It was addressed to J. B. Harden, Esquire. That was the alias he used when he took the wine vaults at Paddington, explained McNorton, and had been posted about a week before. Attached to the bottom of the account, which was for three pounds ten shillings, was a little slip calling attention to the fact that this account had probably been overlooked. Beale's finger traced the item for which the bill was rendered, and McNorton uttered an exclamation of surprise. "'Curious, isn't it?' said Beale, as he folded the paper and put it away in his pocket, "'how these very clever men always make some trifling error which brings them to justice. I don't know how many great schemes I have seen brought to nothing through some such act of folly as this, some piece of theatrical bravado, which benefited the criminal nothing at all. "'Good gracious,' said McNorton, wonderingly. "'Of course, that's what he is going to do. I never thought of that. It is in the neighborhood of Horsham we must look for him, and I think if we can get one of Monsieur Bellingham out of bed in a couple of hours' time, we shall do a good night's work.' They went outside, and again questioned the policeman. He remembered the car turning round and going back the way it had come. It had probably taken one of the innumerable side roads which led from the main thoroughfare, and in this way they had missed it. "'I want to go to the megaphone office first, said Beale. "'I have some good friends on that paper, and I am curious to know how bad the markets are. The night cables from New York should be coming by now. In his heart was a sickening fear which he dared not express. What would the morrow bring forth? If this one man's cupidity and hate should succeed in releasing the terror upon the world, what sort of world would it leave? Through the windows of the car he could see the placid policeman patrolling the streets, caught a glimpse of other cars, brilliantly illuminated, bearing their laughing men and women back to homes who were ignorant of the monstrous danger which threatened their security and life. He passed the facades of great commercial mansions, which in a month's time might but serve to conceal the stark ruin within. To him it was a night of tremendous tragedy and for the second time in his life, in the numbness, induced by the greater peril and the greater anxiety, he failed to wince at the thought of the danger in which all of us stood. Indeed, analyzing his sensations, she seemed to him on this occasion less a victim than a fellow worker, and he found a strange comfort in that thought of partnership. The megaphone buildings blazed with light when the car drew up to the door. Messenger boys were hurrying through the swinging doors. The two great elevators were running up and down without pause. The grey editor, with a gruff voice, threw over a bundle of flimsies. Here are the market reports, he growled. They are not very encouraging. Beale read them and whistled, and the editor eyed him keenly. "'Well, what do you make of it?' he asked the detective. "'Wheat at a shilling a pound already. God knows what it's going to be tomorrow.' "'Any other news?' asked Beale. "'We have asked Germany to explain why she has prohibited the export of wheat, and to give us a reason for the stocks she holds and the steps she has taken during the past two months to accumulate reserves. An ultimatum? Not exactly an ultimatum. There's nothing to go to war about. The government has mobilized the fleet, and the French government has partially mobilized her army. The question is, he said, would war ease the situation? Beale shook his head. The battle will not be fought in the field, he said. It will be fought right here in London, in all your great towns, in Manchester, Coventry, Birmingham, Cardiff. It will be fought in New York, and in a thousand townships between the Pacific and the Atlantic, 
and if the German scheme comes off, we shall be beaten before a shot is fired. What does it mean? asked the editor. Why is everybody buying wheat so frantically? There is no shortage. The harvests in the United States and Canada are good. There will be no harvests, said Beale solemnly, and the journalist gaped at him. End of chapter 31 Recorded by Kirsten Weber Chapter 32 of The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace Chapter 32 The End of Van Herden Dr. Van Herden expected many things, and was prepared for contingencies beyond the imagination of the normally minded. But he was not prepared to find in Oliver Cresswell a pleasant travelling companion. When a man takes a girl against her will from a pleasant suite at the best hotel in London, compels her at the peril of death to accompany him on a motor-car ride in the dead of the night, and when his offence is a duplication of one which had been committed less than a week before, he not unnaturally anticipates tears, supplications, or, in the alternative, a frigid and unapproachable silence. To his amazement, Oliver was extraordinarily cheerful and talkative and even amusing. He had kept Bridgers at the door of the car whilst he investigated the pawnbroking establishment of Messrs. Rosenblum Brothers, and had returned in triumph to discover that the girl, who up to then had been taciturn and uncommunicative, was in quite an amiable mood. "'I used to think,' she said, "'that motor-car abductions were the invention of sensational writers.' "'But you seem to make practice of it. "'You are not very original, Dr. Van Herden. "'I think I've told you that before.' "'He smiled in the darkness as the car sped smoothly through the deserted streets. "'I must plead guilty to being rather unoriginal,' he said. "'But I promise you that this little adventure shall not end as did the last.' "'It can hardly do that,' she laughed. I can only be married once, whilst Mr. Beale is alive. I forgot you were married, he said suddenly. Then, after a pause, I suppose you will divorce him? Why? she asked innocently. But you're not fond of that fellow, are you? Passionately, she said calmly. He is my ideal. The reply took away his breath, and certainly silenced him. "'How is this adventure to end?' she demanded. "'Are you going to maroon me on a desert island, or are you taking me to Germany?' "'How did you know I am trying to get to Germany?' he asked sharply. "'Oh, Mr. Beale thought so,' she replied in a tone of indifference. "'He reckoned that he would catch you somewhere near the coast.' "'He did, did he?' said the other calmly. "'I shall deny him that pleasure.' I don't intend taking you to Germany. Indeed, it is not my intention to detain you any longer than is necessary. For which I am truly grateful, she smiled. But why detain me at all? That is a stupid question to ask, when I am sure you have no doubt in your mind as to why it is necessary to keep you close to me until I have finished my work. I think I told you some time ago, he went on, that I had a great scheme. The other day you called me a Hun, by which I suppose you meant that I was a German. It is perfectly true that I am a German, and I am a patriotic German. To me, even in these days of his degradation, the Kaiser is still little less than a god. His voice quivered a little, and the girl was struck dumb with wonder that a man of such intelligence, of such a wide outlook, of such modernity, should hold to you so archaic. Your country ruined Germany. You have sucked us dry, to say that I hate England and hate America, for you Anglo-Saxons are one in your soulless covetousness, 
is to express my feelings mildly. But what is your scheme? she asked. Briefly, I will tell you, Miss Cresswell, that you may understand that to-night you accompany history and are a participant in world politics. America and England are going to pay. They are going to buy corn from my country at the price that Germany can fix. It will be a price, he cried, and did not attempt to conceal his joy, which will ruin the Anglo-Saxon people more effectively than they ruined Germany. But how? she asked, bewildered. They are going to buy corn, he repeated, at our price, corn which is stored in Germany. But what nonsense, she said scornfully. I don't know very much about harvests and things of that kind, but I know that most of the world's wheat comes from America and from Russia. The Russian wheat will be in German granaries, he said softly. The American wheat, there will be no American wheat. And then his calmness deserted him. This story of the green rust burst out in a wild flood of language, which was half German and half English. The man was beside himself, almost mad, and before his gesticulating hands she shrank back into the corner of the car. She saw his silhouette against the window, heard the roar and scream of his voice as he babbled incoherently of his wonderful scheme, and had to piece together as best she could his disconnected narrative. And then she remembered her work in Beale's office, the careful tabulation of American farms, the names of the sheriffs, the hotels where conveyances might be secured. So that was it. Beale had discovered the plot, and had already moved to counter this devilish plan and she remembered the man who had come to her room in mistake for Van Herden's, and the file of green sawdust he carried, and Beale's look of horror when he examined it. And suddenly she cried with such vehemence that his flood of talk was stopped. "'Thank God! Oh, thank God!' "'But what do you mean?' he demanded suspiciously. "'What are you thanking God about?' "'Oh, nothing, nothing.' She was her eager, animated self. Tell me some more. It is a wonderful story. It is true, is it not? True, he laughed harshly. You shall see how true it is. You shall see the world lie at the feet of German science. Tomorrow the world will go forth. Look, he clicked on a little electric light and held out his hand. In his palm lay a silver watch. I told you there was a code. She was dimly conscious that he had spoken of a code, but she had been so occupied by her own thoughts that she had not caught all that he had said. That code was in this watch. Look, he pressed a knob, and the case flew open. Pasted to the inside of the case was a circular piece of paper covered with fine writing. When you found that ticket, you had the code in your hands, he chuckled. If you or your friends had the sense to redeem that watch, I could not have sent to-morrow the message of German liberation. See, it is very simple. He pointed with his finger and held the watch halfway to the roof that the light might better reveal the wording. This word means proceed. It will go to all my chief agents. They will transmit it by telegram to hundreds of centers. By Thursday morning, great stretches of territory where the golden corn was waving so proudly today will be blackened wastes. By Saturday, the world will confront its sublime catastrophe. But why have you three words? she asked huskily. The Germans provide against all contingencies, he said. We leave nothing to chance. We are not gamblers. We work on lines of scientific accuracy. The second word is to tell my agents to suspend operations until they hear from me. The third word means abandon the scheme for this year. We must work with the markets. A more favourable opportunity might occur. 
is so grand a conception it is necessary that we should obtain the maximum results for our labours he snapped the case of the watch and put it back in his pocket turned out the light and settled himself back with a sigh of content you see you are unimportant he said you are a beautiful woman and to many men you would be most desirable to me you are just a woman an ordinary fellow-creature amusing beautiful possessed of an agile mind though somewhat frivolous by our standards many of my fellow-countrymen who do not think like i do would take you it is my intention to leave you just as soon as it is safe to do so unless a thought struck him and he frowned unless she repeated with a sinking heart in spite of her assurance bridgers was speaking to me of you he who is driving he nodded to the dimly outlined shoulders of the chauffeur he has been a faithful fellow you wouldn't she gasped why not he said coolly i don't want you bridgers thinks you are beautiful is he a hun too she asked and he jerked round towards her if bridgers wants you he shall have you he said harshly she knew she had made a mistake there was no sense in antagonizing him the more especially so since she had not yet learnt all that she wanted to know i think your scheme is horrible she said after a while the wheat distraction scheme i mean not bridgers but it is a very great one the man was susceptible to flattery for he became genial again it is the greatest scheme that has ever been known to science it is the most colossal crime i suppose they will call it a crime that has ever been committed but how are you going to get your code word away the telegraphs are in the hands of the government and i think you will find it difficult even if you have a secret wireless wireless bah he said scornfully i never expected to send it by telegraph with or without wires i have a much surer way Fräulein, as you will see but how will you escape she asked i shall leave england to-morrow soon after daybreak he replied with assurance by aeroplane a long-distant flying machine will land on my sussex farm which will have british markings indeed it is already in england and i and my good bridgers will pass your coast without trouble he peered out of the window this is harsham i think he said as they swept through what appeared to the girl to be a square that little building on the left is the railway station you will see the signal lamps in a moment my farm is about five miles down the shoreham road he was in an excellent temper as they passed through the old town and mounted the hill which leads to shoreham was politeness itself when the car had turned off the main road and had bumped over cart tracks to the door of a large building this is your last escapade miss cresswell or mrs beale i suppose i should call you he said jovially as he pushed her before him into a room where supper had been laid for two you see you were not expected but you shall have bridgers it will be daylight in two hours he said inconsequently you must have some wine she shook her head with a smile and he laughed as if the implied suspicion of her refusal was the best joke in the world nein nein little friend he said i shall not doctor you again my days of doctoring have passed she had expected to find the farm in occupation but apparently they were the only people there the doctor had opened the door himself with a key and no servant had appeared nor apparently did he expect them to appear she learned afterwards that there were two farm servants an old man and his wife who lived in a cottage on the estate and came in the daytime to do the housework and prepare a cold supper against their master's coming bridgers did not make his appearance apparently he was staying with his car about three o'clock in the morning when the first streaks of grey were showing in the sky 
Van Heerden rose to go in search of his assistant. Until then he had not ceased to talk of himself, of his scheme, of his great plan, of his early struggles, of his difficulties in persuading members of his government to afford him the assistance he required. As soon as he turned to the door, she checked him with a word. "'I am immensely interested,' she said. "'But still you have not told me how you intend to send your message.' "'It is simple,' he said, and beckoned to her. They passed out of the house, into the chill, sweet dawn, made a half-circuit of the farm, and came to a courtyard surrounded on three sides by low buildings. He opened a door to reveal another door, covered with wire netting. Behold, he laughed. Pigeons, said the girl. The dark interior of the shed was a flicker with white wings. Pigeons, repeated Van Herden, closing the door, and every one knows his way back to Germany. It has been a labor of love collecting them, and they are all British he said with a laugh. There I will give the British credit. They know more about pigeons than the Germans, and have used them more in the war. But suppose your pigeon is shot down or falls by the way, she asked, as they walked slowly back to the house. I shall send fifty, replied Van Herden calmly. Each will carry the same message, and some, at least, will get home. Back in the dining-room, he cleared the remains of the supper from the table, and went out of the room for a few minutes, returning with a small pad of paper, and she saw from the delicacy with which he handled each sheet that it was of the thinnest texture. Between each page he placed a carbon and began to write, printing the characters. There was only one word on each tiny sheet. When this was written, he detached the leaves, putting them aside, using his watch as a paperweight, and wrote another batch. She watched him, fascinated, until he showed signs that he had completed his task. Then she lifted the little valise which she had at her side, put it on her knees, opened it, and took out a book. It must have been instinct which made him raise his eyes to her. "'What have you got there?' he asked sharply. "'Oh, a book,' she said, with an attempt at carelessness. "'But why have you got it out? You are not reading.' He leant over and snatched it from her, and looked at the title. "'A Friend in Need,' he read, by Stanford Beale. "'By Stanford Beale,' he repeated, frowning. "'I didn't know your husband wrote books.' She made no reply. He turned back the cover and read the little title page. But this is Smiles self help he said. It's the same thing, she replied. He turned another page or two, then stopped, for he had come to a place where the centre of the book had been cut right out. The leaves had been glued together to disguise this fact, and what was apparently a book was, in reality, a small box. "'What was in there?' he asked, springing to his feet. "'This,' she said. "'Don't move, Dr. Van Hatton. The little hand which held the browning was firm, and did not quiver. "'I don't think you are going to send your pigeons off this morning, doctor,' she said. "'Stand back from the table.' She leant over and seized the little heap of papers and the watch. "'I am going to shoot you,' she said steadily. "'if you refuse to do as I tell you, because if I don't shoot you, you will kill me.' His face had grown old and grey in the space of a few seconds. The white hands he raised were shaking. He tried to speak, but only a hoarse murmur came. Then his face went blank. He stared at the pistol, then stretched out his hands slowly toward it. "'Stand back!' she cried. He jumped at her, and she pulled the trigger, but nothing happened, and the next minute she was struggling in his arms. The man was hysterical with fear and relief, and was giggling and cursing in the same breath. He wrenched the pistol from her hand and threw it on the table. 
"'You fool! You fool!' he shouted. "'The safety catch! You didn't pull it down!' She could have wept with anger and mortification. Beale had put the catch of the weapon at safety, not realizing that she did not understand the mechanism of it, and Van Herden, in one lightning glance, had seen his advantage. "'Now you suffer!' he said, as he flung her in a chair. "'You shall suffer, I tell you. I will make an example of you. I will leave your husband something which he will not touch.' He was shaking in every limb. He dashed to the door and bellowed, "'Bridges!' Presently she heard a footstep in the hall. "'Come, my friend,' Van Herden shouted. "'You shall have your wish. It is—' "'How are you going, Van Herden? Quietly or rough?' He spun round. There were two men in the doorway, and the first of these was Beale. "'It's no use your shouting for Bridgers, because Bridgers is on the way to the jug,' said McNorton. "'I have a warrant for you, Van Herden.' The doctor turned with a howl of rage, snatched up the pistol which lay on the table, and thumbed down the safety catch. Beale and McNorton fired together, so that it seemed like a single shot that thundered through the room. Van Herden slid forward and fell, sprawling across the table. It was Friday morning, and Beale stepped briskly through the vestibule of the Ritz-Carlton, and, declining the elevator, went up the stairs two at a time. He burst into the room where Kitson and the girl were standing by the window. "'Wheat prices are tumbling down,' he said. The message worked. "'Thank heaven for that,' said Kitson. Then Van Herden's code message telling his gang to stop operations reached its destination? "'Its destinations,' corrected Beale cheerfully. "'I released thirty pigeons with the magic word. "'The agents have been arrested,' he said. "'We notified the government authorities, "'and there was a sheriff or a policeman in every post-office "'where the code word came through.' Van Herden's agents saw some curious telegraph messengers yesterday. Kitson nodded and turned away. "'What are you going to do now?' asked the girl, with a light in her eyes. "'You must feel quite lost without this great quest of yours.' "'There are others,' said Stanford Beale. "'When do you return to America?' she asked. He fenced the question, but she brought him back to it. "'I have a great deal of business to do in London before I go,' he said. "'Like what?' she asked. "'Well,' he hesitated, "'I have some legal business.' "'Are you suing somebody?' she asked, willfully dense. He rubbed his head in perplexity. "'To tell you the truth,' he said, "'I don't exactly know what I've got to do, or what sort of figure I shall cut. I have never been in the divorce court before.' "'Divorce court?' she said, puzzled. "'Are you giving evidence? Of course, I know detectives do that sort of thing. I have read about it in newspapers. It must be rather horrid. But you are such a clever detective. Oh, by the way, you never told me how you found me. It was a very simple matter, he said, relieved to change the subject. Van Herden, by one of those curious lapses which the best criminals make, left a message at the pawnbroker's which was written on the back of an account for pigeon food sent to him from a Horsham tradesman. I knew he would not try to dispatch his message by the ordinary courses, and I suspected all along that he had established a pigeon post. The bill gave me all the information I wanted. It took us a long time to find the tradesman, but once we had discovered him, he directed us to the farm. We took along a couple of local policemen and arrested Bridgers in the garage. She shivered. "'Twas horrible, wasn't it?' she said. He nodded. "'It was rather dreadful, but it might have been very much worse,' he added philosophically. "'But how wonderful of you to switch yourself from the crime of that enthralling character 
to a commonplace divorce suit. This isn't commonplace, he said. It is rather a curious story. Do tell me. She made a place for him on the window ledge, and he sat down beside her. It is a story of a mistake and a blunder, he said. The plaintiff, a very worthy young man, passably good-looking, was a man of my profession, a detective, engaged in protecting the interests of a young and beautiful girl. I suppose you have to say she's young and beautiful, or the story wouldn't be interesting, she said. It is not necessary to lie in this case, he said. She is certainly young and undoubtedly beautiful. She has the loveliest eyes. Go on, she said hastily. The detective, he resumed, herein after called the petitioner, desiring to protect the innocent maiden from the machinations of a fortune-hunting gentleman no longer with us, contracted, as he thought, a fraudulent marriage with this unfortunate girl, believing thereby he could choke off the villain who was pursuing her. But why did the unfortunate girl marry him, even fraudulently? Because, said Beale, the villain of the piece had drugged her, and she didn't know what she was doing. After the marriage, he went on, he discovered that so far from being illegal, it was good in law, and he had bound this wretched female. Please don't be rude, she said. He had bound this wretched female to him for life. Being a perfect gentleman, born of poor but American parents, he takes the first opportunity of freeing her. And himself, she murmured. As to the poor misguided lad, he said firmly, you need feel no sympathy. He had behaved disgracefully. How? she asked. Well, you see, he had already fallen in love with her, and that made his offence all the greater. If you go red, I cannot tell you this story, because it embarrasses me. I haven't gone red, she denied, indignantly. So what are you—what is he going to do? Beale shrugged his shoulders. He is going to work for a divorce. But why? she demanded. What has she done? He looked at her in astonishment. What do you mean? he stammered. Well, she shrugged her shoulders slightly and smiled in his face. It seems to me that it is nothing to do with him. It is the wretched female who should sue for divorce, not the handsome detective. Do you feel faint? No, he said hoarsely. Don't you agree with me? I agree with you, said the incoherent Beale. But suppose her guardian takes the necessary steps. She shook her head. The guardian can do nothing unless the wretched female instructs him, she said. Does it occur to you that even the best of drugs wear off in time, and that there is a possibility that the lady was not as unconscious of the ceremony as she pretends? Of course, she said hurriedly, she did not realize that it had actually happened, and until she was told by Apollo from the central office, that's what you call Scotland Yard in New York, isn't it, that the ceremony had actually occurred, she was under the impression that it was a beautiful dream. When I say beautiful, she amended in some hurry, I mean not unpleasant. Then what am I to do? said the helpless Beale. Wait till I divorce you, said Oliver, and turned her head hurriedly, so that Beale only kissed the tip of her ear. End of chapter 32 End of The Green Rust by Edgar Wallace Recorded by Kirsten Weber